What's going on, everybody? Hope you guys are doing well. My name is MJ the Future. Thank you for joining me on my stream today. Hopefully, if you hear the sound of my voice, you've made it through the eclipse. Um, today is April 8th, Monday, 2024, and we're just going to cook up. I know a lot of different things in hip hop have happened. Um, we've had the uh, Drake versus J. Cole versus Kendrick. We've had the J. Cole response and apology. We've had Looks like Meek Mill um, heating up some stuff with Wale again on Twitter. And um, Style Speed dropped a new freestyle, which is all awesome. Talking about bringing the vibes back. But the apology undid the vibes. Let's talk about it. In the meantime, we're going to get this stream started. Make sure you hit a like on the way in here. If you're not subscribed, definitely subscribe. We'll be in FL Studio cooking up. We'll jump around if we need to. And yeah, shout to Replay Game for all the comments. Let's go ahead and give uh, Ke uh, Kendrick some motivation with the Silent Hill remix, Trap and Easter by MJ the Future. Let's go. Had to turn my microphone around. Maybe you can hear me better. Pushing the snakes, I'm pushing the fakes, I'm pushing them all off me like, pushing them all off me like, yeah. <laughs> I be immune to shit, tucking the broom and shit, done with the soul and shit. Know you a joke, my ass is the clothes, I hell like the moon and shit. Know the results, the ballad is in, man, I'm about to boom again. You funny, dog. Peekaboo, can't hide behind your money, dog. A week or two, I meditate on running loss. Swerve, 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 shake the currents off. Yeah. Push these niggas off me like, ooh. Push these bitches off me like, ooh. Push these niggas off me like, ooh. Pushing the snakes, I'm pushing the fake, I'm pushing them all off me like, ooh. Pushing them all off me like, ooh. Yeah. Head up, chest out, silence. I'm stressed out, shh. Be quiet. I'm stressed out, stressed out, stressed out. It's like six o'clock. Did you talk too much? You making me fall for love. I mean, it's hard enough. I mean, it's. They don't fuck with me even if they could. Pull out the stick, hit a bitch in the wood. First part roll was breaking the hood. Don't worry about us over here, we good. The AP Roman numeral. Everybody go, I need pharmaceuticals. I ran my whole conglomerate. I was just mapping shit out in the kooka. Cool, side cool, it's a funeral. Track hard rocks like a sneak shot. Big ol' ruby diamond on my pinky finger. The bitch look like a mini pop. One on my mind, one on your head. Hang my three times when you come to the chair. Bear cross, cup a nigga fed. In the studio with Kayla, I fresh out the bed. Yeah, niggas can't stand the rain. Niggas don't stand a chance. Yeah, shuffle like candy paint. I spend the bin in the bin. I call the bitch off of Google app. I'm the type to put my shoe up. I had to survive off a tuna belt. I'm just intent on the wood like who's that? Who cool take off like his man? Be the dope with a folk, I'm whipping up super fat. I'm doing scams in the lab. Every Thursday, girls, they spend the time with my daughter, make me go hard. Every Sunday, Sunday, teach my boy to be a man. I ain't had no father. Better love with a block, I ain't had no punk. You saw those shots on Marvel. Stacking them on a proper awkward diamonds, look like Marvel. All of my water, awkward beating with block up to each bottle. I don't want your ice, but I want your life, but fuck, I still might rob him. <laughs> K-Dot was like, ugh, brother, what's that? What's that, brother? What's that? Ugh. <laughs> what's going on, everyone? My name is MG The Future. Thank you for joining me on my live stream today. Today was a solar eclipse. How are you guys feeling now that the world hasn't ended and none of the reptile people have come down and said hi? <laughs> it was a good, it was a cool solar eclipse though. I don't remember too many of them where I noticed them, I should say, like when I'm watching or waiting for it. I think the only memory I had was a loop. And maybe if you like on point with your memorization of solar eclipses, maybe you remember this one in the Northeast region. I want to say it's between the year 1992, maybe it is 1992. I mean, the first thing that came to mind, but I remember being a kid, like first, second, third grade, definitely those. 
And it was a solar eclipse in the afternoon. We saw it, I think, right before lunchtime. So it was early solar eclipse. And they showed us how to cut a hole, pause, out of like a note card or a punch card or something. Y'all know about them punch cards. And um, somehow or another, we hold up this hole in the card to the sun. And you should be able to see the shape of the eclipse on your hand or something. Some some, some type of cool indigenous workaround my teacher, Miss Baynard, had. Because we didn't have the cool 3D solar glass vision. You know what I'm talking about? But this is like 91, 94, some, somewhere in between that transient. That's the only solar eclipse that I could think of that like stood out as a memory to me. And then this one, of course. And I don't know what that is. I don't know if they're the same type of thing or the same type of loop cycle. I've been seeing a lot of different talk about it, like symbolically what this stuff would mean to some of the, you know, the ancestors or the people who came before us who figured this stuff to be important, whether that's just to track the energies for crops or, you know, the, the flow of civilization and life, if you will, especially here in this domain. It seems very important to pay attention to that at some point in your life. Um, I wouldn't go as far as to say it's a requirement, of course. This is not like a practice or religious belief. It just seems to be a, a large portion of common sense, given the nature of our reality. And those two things in the sky seem to be, you know, the main attraction. I will say, though, when it happened that I experienced it today, the only thing that really stood out to me, because, again, I didn't have the solar glasses. I kind of raw dogged it with my own eyes for a little while, pause. And the sun was just as bright as it was a couple of months ago when I said to myself, it feels like there's two suns up. Not necessarily because it got hotter, because it was been cold, especially in the Carolinas. Like, it was just been cold. But the sun, when you look at it, is like double bright. Like, you couldn't see it. And I think that kind of finally cooled down last month. And then today, right before the eclipse, it did the same thing. Like, I could not look at the sun, like, even if I wanted to. Uh, then the eclipse happened. It got dark a little bit. All the birds shut up. I was like, look at these bots. <laughs> and it felt like a midnight dream for real. Because it didn't get yeah, where I'm at. It didn't go, you know, total eclipse. It just went kind of like dream vision. You know what I'm talking about? You ever notice, like, I don't know if that's true for you, but for me, especially almost all of my dreams are nighttime, but not like nighttime with a moon in the sky. And there's a sense of time, but like. It's not lit up, so it's almost like you're in the house at nighttime or. Even when it's outside, it's not bright. You know what I'm talking about? It's like it's, it's like the subconscious mind doesn't waste any pro GPU processing power on um, ambient inclusion and shit when you sleep in it. So, <laughs> or the fact that your dreams are your third eye and your third eye, you know, doesn't bring in as much light. Uh oh, there we go. Ooh. Hashtag calcification, but whatever light it lets in. The people, I mean, it does. My, my brain does a great job describing people like. People and situations. And, and, and the best thing about dreaming is the mysteries or the clues that it gives you when you start figuring them out. Like once you start understanding like how you being getting trolled by your subconscious mind, like in certain cases, like you're like, oh, okay. That's weird. It's weird that it has its own language to communicate the same concepts to you. If not, it's more profound actually than language, honestly, it, or English, we should say. Because your dream be telling you so much just by how it feels. And not even like what someone said. Like, yeah, we put the roosters in the backyard under the four by four. <laughs> You're like, what the fuck is that? But you kind of like process the feeling of it. Like, because, you know, in a dream, you wake up in a dream. And you're like, where am I? And you're like, who are these people? And you don't, st you don't wake up most of the time because none of the answers really matter. The dream is happening whether you figure out the answers or not. And it just keeps progressing before you can choose to do something. Unlike in real life. You don't get that much progress by, you know, so like in an in a easy dream, I could wake up in a room, a person can be in front of me, I can follow that person, I can go out that door that led to a different room that wasn't there originally, turn around, try to go back to the original room, never get back to it, get frustrated. Next thing you know, I'm outside. So like, fuck the door, fuck the stairs, I'm outside. Then I'm looking for a bus or a car. Then you get into like a little car accident and you're like, wait a minute, ain't no cops coming. I'm in a fucking dream. Then you get back in the car and it's like driving sideways. Like you go through a whole lot in a dream sometimes and just like 15 seconds for real. It seemed like in real life, you actually got to walk, breathe, sweat, eat. So it's not that, you know what I'm saying? It, it, it hits you different because you're processing feelings as things keep changing. Whereas in real life, we're time stretched. You know, you got to wait to see 
how that person is going to respond to your text message. You got to wait and see if Kendrick Lamar is going to respond to your battle rap before you apologize. But in dreams, everything's instant. The manifestation of your question is instant. Or if you're wondering about this, it shows up. If you're looking for this, it shows up. Or with the law of attraction or magnetism, you learn the more you want to access something in a dream, the more it runs away from you. And you're almost chasing right before you wake up. Can I get a witness? So it's interesting to manage those energies. And like, how do you manage them? You fall asleep. You know what I'm saying? Like when you fall asleep, you ain't like, how do you even implement this stuff you're hearing right now? Or how do I even implement change in my dreams from a waking state? It reminded me of that episode of Rick and Morty where they had like the nighttime shift of everybody that would like do crunches and stuff so they can get strong while they sleep. And then they turned on the night, the night people turned on them. It's like a zombie thing. That's what it seemed like. Like, how do I get messages to my subconscious while I'm awake? Like, yo, nigga, next time you jump into that portal to take us to that city, I want you to stand by the bus stop. We got to start at the bus stop. Like, is there a two way communication for real? It don't seem like it. But it seems to me that um, an eclipse kind of does that. It uh, technically the way I process it was like we just went through two days and once. Even when you take some of that religious uh, hangover from, you know, Passover or resurrection. You were in the middle of a leap year where they added an extra day to February. And then you lived on a day where it was nighttime and daytime twice. So technically, you just sped run a day. Now, day is measured by night and daytime. And night and daytime is ruled by the sun and the moon. I think this technically qualifies, you know, distance or space be damned. Um, I think it qualifies as two days. So what does that mean? So for like a very short period of time, you were asleep. You entered the subconscious realm, right? So much so the birds responded to it. The birds got quiet. So even the birds thought they were going to sleep. You understand what I'm saying? So it's not just like the sun is on the other side of the equator. No, 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 no. Let's take it back to a more primitive form. The sun is out, period. It's dark. That's nighttime. Sun came back. It's daytime. Now, all of a sudden, the sun's somewhere else setting. Stop playing with me. So, whatever that is, it reminds me of a dream. That darkness reminded me of a dream. I think that's why I connected those two things. It, it felt like a dream. Um, I don't feel dramatically different. I will say, like, a lot of the things that you were supposed to think about based on how they were programming this or pushing on us leading to this point, that shit disappeared real quick. Once you actually experienced it, it didn't feel tense. It didn't feel nervous at all. It felt peaceful as fuck. Honestly, this time, you know, every solar event. And then we got a lunar event tonight still too, right? Is what is a new moon or something? It's hashtag Aries. And I mind you, this is a music production thing. I know. Don't get, I'm not going to spend too much time on the, on, on the eclipse source, but it's a temporal marker for the future. When we speak on these things in past sense and we can go to videos and be like, what was going on in humanity? More so than which polo snare I will be using today again. So, yeah, so the energies were, were definitely a shifting. Then I noticed it like, well, OK, so it manifested peacefully for me. But what about everybody else? And that was interesting about this day was I'm waking up to um, the hip hop beef shenanigans because, you know, believe it or not, I'm a hip hop producer and I've been so for a while and I've been following the craft and all the messiness for years and years and years. I was definitely team hashtag toxic masculinity as a teenager. So um, it's kind of my thing. But this morning we woke up. And it had been decided by who? I don't know that J. Cole should apologize for his uh, his battle raps against Kendrick Lamar right here, starting here, starting here. So I wake up. Shouts to the brother Sun God, a.k.a. A.M. The legend. He posted at five o'clock in the morning. So, you know, that's before you even got a chance to eat your Wheaties. And I said to myself, nah. <laughs> I said to myself, nah. You know, I had to get into my classic colorism bag. And I was like, man, this is some light skin shit for real. But be it as it may, I was just speaking about this type of thing on a 3 a.m. Just, you know. I was just... I was just kind of saying that. I was just kind of saying how, like, uh, you have these two brothers, 
you know, and, and I'm going to jump into the esoteric. I think all three of those brothers are talented. So I'm not even in that type of bag. I don't think nobody sucks. I don't think anyone's like wrong or right. It's not even that type of energy. Obviously, like <laughs> let's not overstate the obvious. We're, I, I, I can't even put my hip hop narc energy in any of this because I overstand it a little bit better. Rest in peace, brother panic. One of his last messages. So I, so I kind of see and peep where this is going, especially with a solar and lunar event occurring and, and those energies dictated and, you know, the Aquarius energy dictated and all of our would be gurus have dictated a change of heart, if you will, energetically for a minute now. So maybe this is just, you know, the, the place marker in this video too, is just kind of like the place marker where things are going to get different. And if it's going to get different on the social masculine hip hop entertainment level, even though, you know, how I am, I call some fuck shit out real quick. Like niggas just acting like this because ain't no money in music right now. And these labels and these foreigners are running them up with the bag and there's nothing they can do about it because of NDAs and contracts. And so we got to keep the show going on and make it look like it's still a sport that's worth supporting. But I can put that to the side, too. I can just, you know, you know, reason with humility and humbleness that has never existed in this art form. And I mean, never. But it does now. So 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 if this is a new day, <laughs> get it, it's a new day. Um, so technically J Cole apologized yesterday. So you can just go to 3am and see how our resident battle rapper podcasters and sympathizers have felt about this. It was actually a really good winded conversation. And a brother arsonist really didn't call nobody out by their name really, but he will challenge you. And that's what I like. I like the contentious spirit of Negroes wanting to be right and having good points. And, and it showed up today. I'm trying to remember exactly what I said about this, though. That's the freakiest thing about this uh, moment. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Kendrick representing a Hebrew Israelite concept or idea. And on the pimp a butterfly that everyone talks about, I think some of the takeaways from that project are the interludes, especially when he's talking to Lucifer, right? Hashtag Venus, you know, crescent moon and star. I think the brother Dab was trying to do a build today about how the eclipse is not caused by the moon, which for the first time in human history, yo, at least on my algorithm and timeline, I've seen people question that. I've never seen nobody question that in mass before. So that tells me something else has changed as well. So if if, if we had a, a we need a, um, a, not a notary, we need one of them people that be in the courthouse taking notes. And no, I'm not talking to you, United States Corporation. Don't be cute. I'm talking about like just on some civilization and culture shit. Like someone, what do they call it, a stenographer? We need someone taking notes of some of these things. Th you know, theoretically, I mean. Because it's so much, because so much is changing foot. So, so much is changing polarity, right? Like, it's really what they, what they call it, a 20, 2012 pole shift, right? And poles, you know, based on how we were taught in America, which tells you everything, uh, doesn't, we, I don't think they really broke that down for real, for real, for real. I've done this once when I talked about the Kabbalion, but I'll, I'll just do a, a brief reminder about this. You can apply this to your music career, young producer. Yes, the hell you can. Don't, don't you stick around with me. You want to, you want to learn how to think three things at once. Don't you worry about it. It's easy. So we, we, we can say it's like a pole shift, pole position. Y'all remember that game? They act like that game was crazy. That game was annoying. You know what else was annoying on Nintendo? They had that little uh, dirt track game. You know what I'm talking about? You go around a little circle on the track. And I think the camera kind of follows you. And you start glowing and stuff like Mario Brothers and people blow your shit up. But it was a racing game. I think it was in a dirt track. Yeah. And then they had the motorbike game. Like, yo, peep game. I forgot what the hell that game was called for real low key, high key. But y'all think Tony Hawk Pro Skater was it? Mm -mm. No, no, nigga. Uh, skater die too. <laughs> Stay woke, paper boy. <laughs> you wasn't outside for real, nigga. And um, this X was it called Excite Bike? Oh, look how I remember that. L look, look at five year old me. Excite Bike lets you make your own track, dog. That was the illest shit ever. Like instead of me just playing the game and sucking at it, like I did. Pause. I was like trying to make my own ramps, like because they let you pick certain assets and 
I guess create ramps. If, if correct me if I'm wrong, I'm almost certain Excite Bike lets you make your own track. Your you know a horizontal track nonetheless. But I think that was the first video game that did that. That implemented customization of a level into a Nintendo game. Like it's Nintendo dog. Like that was, that game was hot. That game was hot. I always I always try to imagine these things doing backflips, but they didn't start doing backflips until like Tony Hawk. Tony Hawk was like the first game where they actually let you do like fucking backflips. Like for real, like, like anytime you want it, like judiciously. No nah, cap. I didn't take that back. What led up to that? Cause you know, the same people that made WCW Nitro because WCW Nitro wanted to do no backflips off the top rope. I remember, but WCW Thunder, them niggas was letting you do the seven year itch off the top rope to the outside. You know what I'm talking about? It wasn't as good as Nitro or uh, the soup, the 64 and shit in terms of physics. But it was like a, a crazy wrestling arcade game, um, especially with like us. Uh, ah, shit. I just got a goddamn pimple on my forehead in real time. Lord have mercy. That shit hurt when it pops. Pause. But um, nah, nigga. WCW Thunder. I know there's a lot of nostalgic people out there. Go ahead and play that. Go ahead and play that WCW Thunder because you can do backflips. So boom, same engine. And then that gave us Tony Hawk. But I'm trying to remember too. Jet Moto on PlayStation 1 kind of lets you do backflips, which you would have to do. Is clip so there's a I think it was a Jet Moto two, it's on all of them you can do it but on Jet Moto two, I had the demo disc you feel me, you start on this track there's a highway in the in the ocean and it's a broken up highway and what you would have to do, is instead of you know jumping on a ramp thinking a nigga about to do a backflip you have to clip, the highway, now check this shit out I'm a little kid figuring out how to do that so you 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 approach the highway and you clip it at the corner. And I guess the physics engine shoots you higher into the air than the actual fucking ramp. And then you can like land a backflip. I learned how to do that watching some white boys on a bike in real life. <laughs> I remember being like six years old, standing outside in the suburbs of Jersey and um, at my aunt's house. And these white boys was on these BMX bikes, like before pegs got hot. But they were like in the street, weaving into the, um, I can't even explain this. Uh, like if you're standing, Let's say I'm a little kid here, you know, I'm in the driveway and shit, and this is the street. So this right here is technically the sidewalk. You know what I'm saying? It's a sidewalk. Imagine, use your imagination. So I'm facing the street and the dude is on the bike. You feel me? And what these white boys were doing, I think at that time, I was a little kid. So, you know, everybody bigger than you older, they could be like 14. I don't think they're much older than 14 at the time. Coolest white boys I've seen. And um, they're weaving in and out of driveways into the street and into the driveway. It's hard to explain, but they would do it by uh, clipping your driveway and curb. So it's like this little pocket right here. And, and it's real stupid. You want to roll a wheel over that normally in real life. But because this ledge is coming up to the corner of the driveway here, you know, because your driveway is going down and the curb is lining it like almost like a trapezoid, like a ramp, almost like the corner it corners a ramp. And they would cut into that bunny hop it somehow. And I think I don't know if they pop their front wheel on a curb or if they pop their back wheel off that curb, like just that little dip. They'll weave in, pop, and like clear the whole fucking thing and go back into the street. And they just kept doing that all the way up and down the street. And like, I've been trying to do like fucking um, endos and um, bunny hops my whole goddamn life. And I still haven't figured out that fucking trick. But if you put me on a motherfucking video game, it works. <laughs> Shout out to them. But um, yeah, fucking t like the one that was real aggy to me, Nintendo 64, 1080 snowboarding. What the fuck? You got a goddamn game called 1080 and you can't do a fucking 1080. Like that was false advertisement. Shout out to Cool Borders 3 for really holding us down. You could really do a rodeo flip for real. I don't know what 1080 was talking about, but that's like some SSX tricky with no tricks. And I just like, nah, that ain't even the way we live for real. So imagine my face when Tony Hawk came and, and then they blessed us right after that. Because I told y'all, Corey, your crisis too. hashtag classic games. You should play it. Um, This is like your crazy taxi, but with a bike. But anyway, fucking um, the Matt Hoffman joint, Tony Hawk Pro Skater, but with bikes. That shit was crazy, too. I never thought I'd see the day they master those physics like that. But unfortunately, no one cares about that game. But yeah, Cool Borders 3, Tony Hawk Pro Skater, Matt Hoffman. Skater Die 2, Excite Bike. 
those are classics. Shouts, shouts to my young producer tribe. Not, it, 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 look, we got to pass down the recipes. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to the chat. We got the brother starstruck. He said, food, feed me Seymour. I'm going to get back to that pole shift too. Um, Daniel Berry Sports Highlights. Hey, everyone. Salute to you, man. King Lemuel's in the building. He said, I'm sitting up here playing with my taser. Pause. Oh, man. Some of our brothers are going through it, though. Some of our, we're having a release of energy, too, which I think, then get back to that cold thing. I am Malachi. It's in the building. Shout out to you with the mod hammer. Pause. Mr. Now, peace. It's 1 a.m. in the boot. How's the sun and moon intercourse over there? That's hilarious. Gray Fox is in the building. George Savory is in the building. Pat Lee, peace, peace. We here. Not going to lie to start getting, the sky started getting dark and I started praying like a mug. <laughs> Pat Lee started praying when it got dark. Man, I, was, I feel like I was like in a meditative, not meditate. Yeah, I guess you can call it meditation because meditation ain't always sitting down with your eyes closed in the darkness with your legs crossed. But I was kind of in a meditative state, a ponderance, if you will, with, with knowing the, the most beautiful part about today is the preponderance without the anxiety or nervousness about something unexpected. Like that energy been in and out of my life for years now. But today it won't, it won't really on it like that. It won't on me like that. Or I won't just, you know, I wasn't attached to it. Like I would have expected. So when it got dark like that, I had that light bulb moment. It was like, ah, it's a new day. <laughs> and then it got bright again. And then the birds turned right back on. Cause they some bots. And I was like, all right, cool. Let's get it. It's the save room, bro. It's just like, um, speaking of video game classics, uh, Resident Evil. I don't know which one used to give me the damn anxiety attack. That damn stair music. Motherfucking Dane Calloway uses the stair music from Resident Evil. I don't know why he do that. That, that is nerve wracking, bro. I can't finish a whole video because he want to put me back in Raccoon City. But, um, you know how I like, uh, I think I want to say it was Nemesis that I'm thinking about. I remember being stuck in Resident Evil 1 with the hunters that start crawling on the ceiling. And if you don't have the right shotgun or grenades for them, you're done. Um, especially in PS1 days, it wasn't like workarounds. <laughs> so I was done off of that. I don't think it was Leon either. Was it? Was it the one when they introduced Leon? One of them. But you got to go into like a safe room and get on the typewriter. And all of them have that. But this one in particular is like downstairs, safe room typewriter, storage chest, whoop de whoop And when you get inside that, the music's calm and peaceful. So you save the game real quick and, you know, you, you, you plan out your next location or you hear the sounds and stuff, you know, like you don't have some ops. So let me go ahead and put these herbs together and get some ammo if you can. That's the one thing I hate about the early Resident Evils. They ain't give you enough. They ain't give you enough firepower for the end of the world at a police station. I ain't going to hold you like the fact that you had to ration your fucking uh, acid grenades to fight the spider. And then you had to hope you had some left over for tyrant. Like that is too much. That's too much. You should give me a little floating box in the middle of the map. Like you did with Leon. When you brought Leon back on four resident evil four to me is the best resident evil I've played mechanically. And I don't like the two player one, the one after that, but the one before that, when he was in that weird Moorish Portuguese ass town with the giant robots and shit. And everybody in that town was dead. And that giant Undertaker dude was chasing you and they let you interact with him instead of just, you know, tyrant punching your head off. Uh, not tyrant nemesis, but um, the mechanics and being able to get ammo and run up into your boy. He was like, what are you buying? What are you selling? Like that was the best addition to, to any of that game franchise for people like me. But life is like that. How that energy shifts, like once you get to a safe room and things feel safe, when all of a sudden you feel like you can re-balance uh, yourself or, you know, fill up your supplies, fill up your energy again. A lot of this is like that. A lot of this is like that. Um, the eclipse was kind of like that. I kind of felt like when it went dark, I was in the safe room. I was, you know, and you know the day is about to come again. So you pause. So you had to keep going, right? And, and that's what that was like. So I definitely understood when Pat said, yo. When it got dark, it made me feel like praying because isn't praying, getting ready for the next day. Isn't praying, not getting ready for your next battle. It's, it's, it's the same physiological, biological impulse, you know, word, word to that part of us that's tapped into it. Composure slims in the building. King will well, my head throbbing, but not a headache. I, I've had a few of those symptoms too, right up here. Off and on. Gray Fox. The first one I always remember is in 1979 and 2017. King Well said 1982 as well. 
Three Sons, Peace to the Tribe, Kai Robinson, I see you. Starstruck says, Halito Kimakuma. Hey, I don't know what that means. I don't know if I should have said it like that so eagerly. Haru says, peace, y'all. Shout, shout to Denmark. We in the building. King Lowell says, when you get frustrated, that's when I get wild. <laughs> is it when I get frustrated, you get wild? Or is the thing that's making me frustrated the same thing that's making you wild? Mm, mm. Got to figure out what that birth chart is, right? Mr. Now says, I have dreams that are midday, full light, exclusive, or late night, never in the morning. Yeah. There'd be light in my dreams, but it don't be no daytime in my dreams. And I cannot explain it better than that. Because if I shift focus into any of my memories of like the dreams that are repetitive. And I don't know if I've taken my advice on this shit, but to write your dreams down. And I think after like three to six months or so of doing that, you might start peeping how most of your dreams are revisiting the same map. It's almost like your subconscious has a map, like a like a video game. Like, you know how like Fortnite has, that's that's the best way of actually, nah, not Fortnite. What's another one that kind of does that? Yeah, like, yeah, kind of. Not really Fortnite, but we'll run with it. So imagine how like on Fortnite, every season there's the same map. But every time you drop into the map, it's a different game. You're never really playing with the same hundred people and the bus doesn't always clear the same eclipse pattern. Go stay woke. Shout out to Epic. They know something we don't know, but you jump off the bus and the game starts and each time you start, it's different. I think that's the novelty of a battle Royal game or a shooting game is that it's the same mechanics, same environment, but based on the skill level and awareness of the people and bots that are with you, you can, you can, re-experience the same shit with new novelty. The novelty is people participating, which is why those games are so ingenious. The, any great game, it isn't the mechanics. It's like, this is the best cinematics, best graphics, best mechanics. Mm -mm. It's how, how it offers to renew itself every time you play it. Like, how does it regenerate fun? I've, I I've figure that to be like into the subconscious mind where after a while, you'll start seeing you have the same dream places, the same map, the same battle royal map, but unlike a video game, you can't just land in Tilted. Unlike a video game, you don't always see Tilted when you're on that map. So as you document your journeys in the, in, the, in, the, in the waters of your sleep, you'll start to see like certain roads, certain buildings, or certain just directions are the same even. Like even if it's not exactly my house from one dream to another, I get to it exactly the same way. You know, I leave school, walk to the same front of the school, although the, the schools are like AI, like the AI gives you four different versions. It's the same thing with the dream, low key, high key. So it'll randomize the building, but it knows there's a school there. And then from there, the bus down the street, around the corner, walking down the street. That's where I live in the dream at all times when I'm at that map. Then there's other maps. And then I kind of zoomed out a little bit about it longer in time because I've been documenting dreams off and on for longer than months, years now. And I started to notice like, oh shit, all of these places I think are connected. <laughs> I don't even think like you jump into a portal of a dream or memory or however your brain is dealing that. If it's your brain, like we're assuming it's in our head. We don't know that. But the fact that something in your head responds to it or draws it for you, that's that's the real sauce. But whatever that is, just because you can't fly and get to the next other maps doesn't mean, or worlds, if you will, they're, it doesn't mean they're not there. Um, and I think you got to practice meditating and dream work a whole lot before you start getting that type of power. I think some of you get a glimpse of it when you have lucid dreams where you say you can control everything in your dream. I don't know about that. I've never had like a successful control my dream experience. I've had plenty of, I know I'm dreaming experiences where it's kind of like, uh, yeah, it feels like you wake up in your dream. You know what I'm saying? Like, I can't explain it. Like most dreams you remember waking up. There's some dreams, though, you wake up in the dream, right? Like it's almost disorienting. It's almost like your consciousness that takes awareness of where you are now. It does the same type of scanning in the dream. So it's like, oh, shit. You know, the, the, the sleeping mind goes like you're dreaming. And then you respond to it. It's like, yeah, I'm dreaming. But where the fuck is that damn hidden mystery at? And because you're conscious, er 
you can seek it and the environment itself is way more stable. It, it's it's not just mid journey or or what is that shit called? Leonardo.ai, random four images can't keep uh consistency across each image. It then becomes Sora, where it's still AI as fuck. It's still this weird place you don't really control or master, but at least as you're going through the dream, the environment and the people shift with you. Those is what I call lucid dreams for me. It's not about my ability to control them or fly and do cool shit. It's more about the awareness and consciousness that somehow creates a more, you know, robust environment of the dream space. And then you can measure those against your other dreams. And you could tell it like in your mind, you could tell they're not the same. Like ones is like little flip books, like image by image, frame by frame that you can recall them. And others are just like memories. Like I was there. I was definitely fucking there. So yeah, man, we're in a dream world now. Gray Fox says, I have wings in my dreams. See what I'm saying? I don't got no cool shit. I'm, I'm human as fuck in my dreams. Haru says, I'm still trying to figure out why some of my dreams be so weird. <laughs> but recently they have been lasting for two or three days, like feelings of three days and no time jump, Mr. Now. So, so everyone's been kind of, you know, going through a thing or two, huh? Haru says, I need to write them all down. I'm slipping. Come on now. Internet peace, brother. Mr. Now says, repetition for me was going the whole day hyper fixated on the question that automatically get answered in a dream that night. I like that when that happens. It doesn't always happen for me. But the hyper fixated is an energy requirement, ain't it? It happened when you need it. And when you need it, you on it. But if you're just trying to be cute and clamorous to get answers, it seems like, you know, you know, insufficient mana or insufficient Vespian gas. <laughs> it's like you don't got enough credits to, you know, use this power here. I think Abraham Lincoln was big on that, too. Like asking yourself a question before you fall asleep and wake up with the answer. I'm almost certain. That was an Abraham Lincoln quote I read in the Prosperity Bible, not knowing at the time he was connected to the Kabbalion or the, you know, three, you know, three initiates. Texas is expecting severe weather today. Oh, man. Gray Fox on the cold thing. He says, I look at this as friendly competition. Ooh, ooh, we Rick. Ah, come on, don't freeze. That's 2012, 21 pole shift. You know what I'm saying? You know what it what it was like. And then you really might know what it's like. You know what I'm talking about? Like what it used to be like when Whitey Ford sang the blues versus what it is now. It, this felt like a MK Ultra on goddamn um Yo, MK Ultra was lit because it came out on Sega. And Super Nintendo. You didn't even need a PlayStation for that. But that's when uh, Mortal Kombat introduced friendship. Friendship again? <laughs> Yo, he said friendship again. That's hilarious. Shao Kahn did not like friendships. We'll get into that. Let me get through the chat, though. Ayo hey, Kakando says, Ayo, hey, the vocals sound crispy. Thank you. King Well says, oh, Cliff video last night was for us in real life. I still didn't watch that video. I try to watch one of those AI bot reading Cliff High videos that they are uploading now. I don't know where those are from or if they're like his sub stacks being, I don't know. It's weird. I don't like the Cliff AI voice, first of all. And then it's sometimes it's speaking like he's in the car. And I was like, what video are you transcribing to a new video? It's stupid. And then Cliff himself hasn't been posting to his sub stack. So I think the only recent Cliff video is that video I put in 3 a.m., which is on BitChute. And of course, you can't. You need a certain setup to play that. But whatever. I'm going to play it now that you brought it up. You said it was for us in real life, IRL. Shout out to King Well. De donde? Oh, question of the day by Mr. Newell himself. If the moon orbits Earth at a speed of 2,288 miles per hour, there was those fours again, then how is it only going from here to here at 500 miles per hour? That means it's going slower. So the moon, did the moon slow down for this eclipse? Yeah, the moon should be in Tibet in four hours if it orbits at 2,288 miles per hour. 
it should be across the world very quickly. And that's how they jig you. Like, oh, the moon is going to China when you wake up in the morning because, you know, it takes 12 hours for it to get halfway across the world. But it but it is slow walked its ass across the United States today. And nobody else had a full moon. So or new moon or whatever the hell. So was it the moon? And that answer is paradoxical, paradoxical. People don't like flirting with it is because what it means, because if the answer is that's not the moon, then the next question is, well, what is it? And you don't have an answer to that because you thought it was the moon. I get that. But when you go to that next subconscious chamber, it's why would they lie about that? Uh Oh, you invoke the powerful they again. Who is they that is lying? And are they your friends or your enemy? Okay, so you got that. Boom. But the Cliff High joint, where is it? Oh, this joint way back. Oh, y'all did the Melchizedek post. I know I posted it somewhere, boy. It's in here. It's a bit shoot. Or you just go to bit shoot and look up Cliff High. There it is. Oh, no, that's bit shoot. Uh, Sabrina Wallace. We getting close. There it is. There it is. So it's like right here. Boom. Your map of contention. And I've been talking about content, a contention a lot. So it's interesting that that word came up. So. Yeah, that part. We'll, we'll get to that. I'll watch that later and I'll, re- I'll report on the news after that. Cool, 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 cool. Bobby Hemet on negative energy through music. Let's do that. I know that some people in the producer community thinks it's just MG the future. That's crazy like this. It's not. Check out Bobby real quick. You start seeing the bad about something, but you be like, damn, ain't nothing happening. My rent paid, my life paid. And you can't figure out what the hell it is, but you just got this bad feeling. Yeah, yeah. And you, but everything is going all right. Yeah, yeah. That's an entity around you uh, of a negative entity trying to get you down, to push you back down to a lower state. All right. If every now and then a genius will come along. Well, the classical genius bar none of jazz is none other than do. Ellington. Yes. That's so right. what you need to do is buy you some damn do Ellington and play it in your house and the music and the energy will change. Okay. Another person is this. Another one which is a Ella. classical entity that is because Duke is passed on 1974. I think another one is Ella Fitzgerald. Get you some Ella Fitzgerald. Now anybody that's bad enough to damn break glass when they're in the physical body, oh, yeah. that's some shit. Right. If the person out of the physical body, that's the kind of shit you want to line up around your ass. Right. <laughs> because what's happening is we got the worst music ever put on the planet. Right. Wow. Not just the rap, just the, just the, the slow stuff cool. and the stuff that yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> you got to be a damn idiot to push this off on me. A president is standing Shout out to Bobby Hemet, man. I know somebody channel was talking about they had a Bobby Hemet update. I didn't watch it because I didn't feel like I believed that necessarily. I think they were interviewing Bobby Hemet's brother, perhaps. I know the brother, Ronnie Smith, Ronnie Smith, who be in the chat. I think Seed of Life is his name in the Discord. He know Bobby Hemet too, and his brother. So I was wait, hoping that they would have crossed paths so that we get a, an official tissue update or one that's a little bit more, you know, direct connect. But I hope he's okay because, you know, Brother Panic transition. And that was a weird. That was weird. I, I, don't, I still don't even know if I believe that for real. But I've had so many people pass in real life and my personal life that even those don't feel real and they are. So it might just be me a little stunned by it. Um, but Bobby, Bobby Hemet, man, he, he be on it. And my, mind you, he's talking about Destiny's Child, um, the Wyclef John remix. <laughs> no, 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 no. And sweet. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he was talking about this programming the kids. And guess what kid it programmed? Huh? They programmed my ass since the mainstream nap between 1996 and 2003. No questions asked. I had the time of my life musically. Everything was new. Everything was fresh. We got Napster towards the end of that. So I was able to listen to everything ever that I ever thought I liked. Plus stuff I didn't know I liked. And then my crazy ass wanted to be a hip hop producer at 14, 15. So then I was downloading samples, AKA classical records, Duke Ellington, Ella Fitzgerald, the Beatles. And so like, you know, for that, for that short amount of time, I got, I downloaded so much tunes in my subconscious mind 
and you can hear a clear difference between the frequency of the radio then and the samples. And it was crazy how like hip hop relied on the frequencies of the samples. That's why it was hard to do boom bap on a Triton. Not because you couldn't make a jazzy piano on a Triton. It's just that the jazzy piano on the Triton is a different frequency than the Duke Ellington joint or whoever. So you, we started hunting that and reverse engineering that, of course, as you know, right? Like on some real ill shit, that's exactly what we've been trying to replicate in the box, right? Today, the kids call it making loops. But 20 years prior, when that, when trying to make that happen, you would, you would just take hypersonic piano, you would EQ it and low pass and reverb and put some vinyl crackle and cool edit in the background and chop it up and reason or some shit. And the shit never connected. It was special when it did, though. Some people did that fake sample bullshit. Recomposing is what we used to call it, like when you're recomposing your composition and chopping up chords and stuff. It's not really like a loop or a time stretch. It's you can tell that it's, you know, what I'm saying being chopped, but sometimes I'm just be fire, but very few in between. Um, But he's right, though. They changed the frequency of our music. And then since changing the frequency of our music, then they changed the frequency of our music again. This time, though, in 2024, I don't think the quote unquote, they did anything. I think the frequency of us changed back to the pole shift here, where prior to this shift and I put 12 or 21. You know what I'm saying? You can't tell that's an or. But, you know, 2021, that other shift we had and all that stuff like the two threes. So that shift I've been noting on these streams, actually, when I say stuff like, why did that tragic mulatto girl get crapped on by her peers? She had the same formula and terrible beat and flow as any other girl that has come out on TikTok or whatever in the past couple of years since the lockdowns. Like all the sisters that have been coming forward since the lockdowns have had the same really cheeky formula that I don't care for because I don't think it's executed very well. And I don't think they don't sound like they're serious. So that always puts me off. It puts me off, especially as an engineer, though. Like I've recorded a brother who couldn't finish 16 bars in one flow, like in one take. Back in the day, we used to practice. <laughs> so you like remember your stuff as best as possible. And instead of reading it, the microphone picks up on your feeling. It could pick up on the delay of you reading it, by the way, geniuses, whether it's a phone or a notebook. And that used to irritate me. So I would make people memorize, well, memorize four bars, memorize eight. Like, let's get as much of this out clearly as possible so that when we compress it all together and do all that cool shit, it sounds cohesive. Like punching in and stuff is awesome, but you can hear it. And, and I, forgive me for not having the DBX 160 to, you know, mask that for you. I didn't have my my uh, what is that called? Spring verb impulse responses to smooth that out then. But we shouldn't have to. We talking about 16s, you know. So I remember recording my boy Rudo, man, Rudo, Jesus Christ. He would try to sing and he just wasn't a singer, but he was cool, though. Like he had some good lyrics and, and, and he 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 was clear about what he wanted to do, but it was hard for him to execute it because he had no practice too. like, you know, not for nothing. You know, it's one thing to hum or keep a tune outside in front of your friends or sing into the radio. But it's another thing when you're in the studio or you're recording it and you get to hear yourself through a microphone that picks up everything and et cetera. And um, so I I, re I remember countless nights <clears throat> recording him over and over and over and over again, the same bar, the same thing, some bar. And like after a while, it was just the, the rap. It wasn't just him, but they would recognize that they're fucking up eventually. Because not only do I get tired of, I didn't have all my, mind you, I don't use shortcuts. So, you know, for me, that shit was hell. I'm using the mouse, stop, rewind, woo, 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 woo. Maybe if I had some shortcuts or some controllers, that wouldn't have been so bad. But it was a pain in the ass to keep clicking and re running it back and letting them hear it. And, oh, you know, oh, man, I messed up. Yo, oh, my bad, my bad. Yo, I missed it, my bad. Like, half the time is that. And then when they actually get the words out, you you hear them uh, uh, lock in with it. And then all of a sudden, they say the wrong shit. Instead of saying turtle, they say myrtle. And it's like the illest take ever, but it's the wrong fucking words. And you're just like, will this ever end? So having those type of memories ingrained in my subconscious 
to hear other people today kind of just rap for fun through their phone, unenthusiastically reading and stuff, I have a cognitive bias to turn the dumb shit off. And that has protected me and my taste, I think, honestly. It limited me a little bit because I couldn't have fun and enjoy some of the vibes the younger generation tend to have turn lemons into lemonade with it, or at least they're pretending they are. But I can't, I can't go for that. No, no. You know, hollow notes, no can do. So I noticed the shift happening when they turned on the old girl. You know what I'm saying? Like something, something's different in the air. The the kids, the bots, the 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 Ebro in the morning type of posting, the uh world star hip hop, all of that, those comment sections are inverted now. They're no longer for the fuckery. They're kind of speaking up. And and you know, that's hopeful for me. It's just scary. Because it was all good just a week ago. Hashtag Eclipse. Shout to Starstruck. 420 Fresh RC Pro-Am. <laughs> Atari Original. Y'all like that. Oh, the video games. The classic shout out to Young and Icy. I thought it was pole position instead of pole shift. The game was pole position. You got it. Damn, not Paperboy and Excitebike. Shale Guevara. No Mercy, the GOAT wrestling game. Peace of the Tribe. Jay Manadu says, Memory Lane. It feels great. Come on now. Young and Icy said Resident Evil 4, best one, IMO. See, see, we, we, we can relate on that. We can re- I think so, too. I think number one was the best story and concept in a video game of its time. It's the reason why I manifested a PlayStation. I played Resident Evil 1 in 1995 on, quote unquote, Uncle Bill's PlayStation. Uncle Bill had every video. He wasn't my real uncle, but he was old enough. So Uncle Bill had PlayStation, Atari, TurboGrafx-16. I've never seen one of those shits. He had Sega, Sega CD, Sega Saturn. He was a big ass kid. And he bought it all for his son, hashtag allegedly Cameron. Cameron was like four, six years older than me. He only came over on the weekends. But sometimes I'd be there when Cam wasn't there when I visit Jersey for the summer. So I think it was like the summer of 95 or summer of 96. It had to be because Resident Evil and PlayStation 1 just came out. I played that Resident Evil most of that day. And, you know, with the loading times and stuff, it's a slow experience. I think that's why four is better because it's faster. But one one is one of the best video games they ever made. Uh, Resident Evil is one of the best video games ever made. It, it changed because you, because remember, I didn't have a PlayStation. So it was like, when I went home, I'm playing Sega Genesis. I had Sega CD. My cousin had Sega Saturn. We had some of those. We started getting some of these 3D games because Sega CD, but that was still video based. It wasn't actual 3D environment yet. So everything that was 3D. Remember that shit, motherfucker? They snuck this in and then they snuck it out. Pause. Maybe they got rid of that because they went into web TV. But back in the day, believe it or not, when you go to Circuit City, radios, Radio Shack or those type of places, Philips used to be the nigga for real. Philips used to be Sony. Like like Philips, the brand, like it was Philips Magnavox. And didn't um Philips Magnavox have the first CD games? I'm pretty sure. Was that called 3DO? Yes. Fact check. 1994. Pre-1995. That's the ill shit about it. This, this, I'm talking about like, like during 93 till infinity, these niggas had 3D video games already. And it was some rich nigga shit because nary a nigga in the hood had it. I had one family member hood adjacent that had it. And that didn't make sense because it was a woman. And, no, you know, I know there's girl gamers, but really like in the time and everything, it just my brain just couldn't r- r- rationalize why she had it. Anyway, so. Our games were still 16 bits. So these 2D animations that are going left and right across the screen. So to go into like, <laughs> you got to aim the shotgun and tilt and lift it at their head. Just that, the mechanic alone, as slow and clunky as it is now. Back then, that shit was mind blowing. Like, yo, I can do headshots. Get the fuck about it. Wait a minute. The headshot take the head off. Get the fuck out of it. Wait, the headshot, they, they don't come back to life. Like, you know what I'm saying? The other video games, they kind of fizzle out and shit, but the body's still there on Resident Evil. That shit, just that, just that is the best game they ever fucking made. I ain't going to hold you. So much so that it is like, I couldn't stop thinking about the PlayStation after that. And then sure as God made green apples. I think my aunt Nikki bought me a PlayStation for my birthday that, that six months later. And then two years later, she sent me like those old CD things you could put on the sun visor in your car that hold like 20 CDs or whatever. She sent me one of them bitches with like 40 PlayStation games without their cases. I didn't ask no questions because when I visited her the next summer, she had the same exact fucking video games. (laughs) 
<laughs> she had the same exact video games and the same type of CD visor with no fucking cases. But yeah, my PlayStation, man. Man, what a time to be alive for real. Fresh is in class. What's good, bro? Oh, he said, I'm talking about my dream state. Shout out to King Well DL. I see you. Young and icy. And you know what you just reminded me of earlier? I had a dream I was in a Resident Evil game, but it had a cyberpunk theme. Mm-hmm. Won't he do it? <laughs> Tyrone Seller says, when I dream, I be slow as hell. Same here. Like, if I dream, you're talking about your movements, right? If you're trying to fight somebody, forget about it. I wanted to uh, get some more light on, and I think I did. Billy Hamilton says, MG, can you please make a Kendrick response type beat on NPC Live? I cannot. I do not have a, a, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm not in front of a desk. So I don't even have a place to put the NPC Live, let alone, uh, I don't have all of the uh, patches uh, or I don't have my preamp combo and all that set up right now. So it, it would irritate me to do so. King Well, I was always thinking about this too as a new moon. The moon don't show in the new moon. Mm-hmm. Gray Fox says, wow, I thought it was just the artist that I worked with. Oh, you're talking about the recording experience? No, brother. <laughs> that is hip hop. <laughs> that is that is any brother who's trying to record to make some extra money to pay his bills between the years of Pro Tools inbox and maybe 2012. I don't know how successful that lifestyle choice has been since then for many of the newcomers. But for me, that was peak. Like recording niggas was like one of those uh, things where it's like I miss my calling because that's actually what I'm supposed to be doing kind of thing professionally. But I bucked against it because I like playing piano. So, but yeah, I noticed like, yeah, my first recording session ever. Besides me, of course, when I bought my microphone, I recorded my, my voice tag. My brother and my little cousin. That was my first recording session recorded. And then I try to rap a little bit on my little struggle reason beats. And that's funny. That's how I met Camo. I did a freestyle over this reason beat. It was only like four or eight bars. You know what I'm saying? And I sent it to Camo. And Camo was kind of like critiquing it, telling me about the beat. You know, the shit wasn't in key. It never is with me. And uh, Camo was like, yeah, but I let my cousin hear it. And he loved this shit. He told you to keep going. And I thought they were gassing me. I was like, nah, I'm going to hang it up real quick. So I stopped rapping. That was like when I was like 15. Then when I was like 19, when I was going to that church, I'd be telling y'all about, I met some rap scallions from Jersey. Uh, and I recorded them like my first session with outsiders. Cause I, I think I recorded a few people before that, like my friends and stuff, but nothing serious. But this is my first time recording a song for rappers that weren't, you know, like I'm doing it as a service type of thing. So that was cool. I definitely had the uh, walk-in closet booth situation with the uh, heavy duty covers, comforters, pillows, and all that dumb shit for no reason. Hashtag eyeball. And um, the shit was horrible, but their bars was hard as fuck though. And it taught me so much because as a producer and beat maker, you want to take every waveform as soon as you get them and level and compress and that like you want to get shit sounding right rappers don't understand that art they just want to keep recording and when they're done they just want you to hit play and it sound like Nas or Jay-Z and that's not how none of this shit worked and it definitely wasn't how none of this shit worked the first time I recorded people so I've always had that problem as an engineer my little OCD ADD or whatever it is a kick in and it'll bother me the S or the clipping or the crossfade, like while they're still trying to figure out the next two bars, I'm like, damn, just let me, you know what I'm saying? And I think that's why niggas got hip and start creating templates. I didn't use templates. Like, just like I make a beat from scratch, I do it every session from scratch because I'm fucking ADD or something. So yeah. And I think that story I always tell you about how like, cause they like all these are on the same vibration. So like recording at home that, that opened up for me. Through that experience, because of the song, too. I got it, too. Hold on. Let me see if I can find it. The beat I made, though, was fire, though. I ain't going to hold you. I ain't going to hold you. Like, hold on. Don't play with me. My artist catalog, right? Studio sessions. Do I got it still? This is before 2008, first of all. 
is Donnie. Rest in peace to his little brother. He got killed in Newark when he was like 21 years old. He was on my bus when I was in 11th or 12th grade. I think his name was Darnell and his brother's name was Donnie. They're like half black, half Puerto Rican. And uh, Darnell, <laughs> little Darnell, because I was uh, older, already hit my growth spurt. He was a little guy. He was a little guy, but he used to talk so much shit. And I loved that for him because he was from up top, but he had moved to North Carolina. And he used to have like these little, he had the Jim Jones cornrows. That always, matter of fact, both of these niggas look like Jim Jones. Like that's the type of race of people they are. And, uh, but anyway, so yeah, years later, obviously when I recorded the song of his big brother, I did not know they were brothers cause they didn't come, they didn't, I didn't meet them all in the same environment. So I remember him from school and what I remember in my head for some reason, hashtag spiritual gang, little, little Darnell would like, cause he was a little, right? So he would talk shit like a big person, but he little. So he would always tell people on the bus, like basically watch your mouth when get my brother. <laughs> and I thought that shit was cute. I was like, yo, it must feel good to have a big brother that got hands because I can never use that card. I ain't got nobody to come to my battle. I got to do that by myself. So he 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 always be like that, but never towards me. It was always cool, but it always, it always made me curious. Let me run into this nigga's brother that he always talking about because they are from up top. So I know the energy different. This is the nigga I recorded, his goddamn brother. And, and, and the thing is, his brother ain't a big dude. His brother, Donnie, like... <laughs> Donnie short is stocky like Styles P and them niggas, but with Jim Jones type of attributes. They little people. They're not, you know. But uh Donnie, Donnie, Donnie knock your, your goofy ass out. So I get it. I respect it. <laughs> you know, from 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 one warrior to another. I get it. I get I get why he bigged up his big brother. I say that to say the the little brother, he's the one that passed away. He got killed. I saw that shit on Facebook, like when he was 21 years old. So that's gotta be like eight to nine years after that and maybe six to seven years after I recorded his brother. So what is that? Like early 2011, 10, 12, like around that time period. So rest in peace to him. He was a good kid, but he, he liked to snap and stuff. But other than that, he was a good kid. He wasn't like in, on the bullshit. He saved all of that for his big brother. And that was his front, my first song. I think I recorded. <laughs> You hear the ambience in the studio? Mm. Okay. Go hard or go home, right? You ready, Carl? Here we go. Ah. Don on some other shit Like all y'all liars and phonies I ain't fucking with Talk behind my back Then they smile in my face Punch niggas in their mouth now Put them in the place I bought this liquor I'ma drink my drink Fuck what y'all say This what God think I'm from murder month Where niggas will spray ya We don't fear shit on earth But the creator I'm do a lot this language You never heard around Hey, you smack a goofy off Your ass getting murdered My new model Stay humble Keep it real, loud niggas don't do shit, the solid ones kill, but you ain't heard about how I slaughter you, son? Five crackers fuck me up, but I put my knife in one. <laughs> Time for them fake niggas to get exposed, put your body up with lead in a lot of bullet holes. Them guys, so yeah. So I did that song. That's like 2006, five, five, six, 2005, 2006, latest. And yeah, I moved, whoop, 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 did the Atlanta thing, 2007, whoop, 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 came back, 2000, cap, damn, that was a quick, oh my God, I'm telling you this story like mad time had passed, my nigga, that's, my, every, all these stories I be telling you is the same two or three years of my life, <laughs> I need to like fast forward to start telling y'all about two, some 2014 shit or something, but um, nah, I went to Atlanta at the end of 2006, I came back before March of 2007. And when I came back, shit fast forwarded for me. I tried a relationship out that was over. And then that shit didn't work. The part two, you know, the, the Usher Confessions part two didn't work out for me. And that was short lived. So by that fall, I was by myself, by myself. And I had just got a brand new job. And I was holding shit down until December. January, February, so maybe that March, that March, that job that I had, that relationship that bailed out, 
all of a sudden that job closed. That was the nigga from Florida shut it down. Whoop, whoop, whoop. And I was about to beat up the chef real bad because he was racist. All you know, that whole story. And um, so I was on some shit though. And, and it kind of reminds me of this season we're in right now. The energy is very freakily similar. Maybe that's why it's so loud right now. Cause I think time is connected like that. Like we think time is connected linearly, like in a straight line. But if you think of time as a spiral or a staircase going, you know, like the golden ratio or uh, the, the seashells, the conches and stuff. If you think about it like that, when you get to this side of the staircase, you can look down and see all the stairs below you and they look the same. The, the, the environment looks the same. It's just your perspective is now elevated. So you look at it differently, but the it is the same. So when you look back on the past sometimes or you have certain dreams or certain reoccurrences happening in your life, that's because you're on that side of your clock or you're on that side of your spiral staircase. So you're always going to see the ocean on that side. Whereas if you keep going and, you know, 2026, it may be more of a volcano on that side. And then you, you link together all the stairs below you that reminded you of the scenery of the volcano. And then and Lord forbid your scenery changes and it gets real freaky. So. Yeah, this is a similar time to this, to these transitions, I think. For me personally, uh, I can't say that's not true for everybody. Everybody don't have the same birth chart, but for my energy is repetitive. Uh, so back then, yeah, the job went away. Woo, 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 woo. And I was I wasn't vexed, though, on some ill shit. It was the calmest I've ever been. Like niggas was about to jump me. And I do my my classical fashion thing I, instead of getting worked up, angry, emotional or whatever, you know, options you have available. I just started laughing. I was like, this nigga is really shutting down this shit. And I had just, and I was laughing because I said, this is my fault. Because when he sent the people in there two weeks prior, he sent a chef, a waitress, like basically the star employees from the Florida restaurant, which is goofy as hell. But he sent the three star employees from the other restaurant. And the cover story was, they're just checking out our workflow trying to help us out, you know, they're trying to figure out, you know, how to make more profits and make the environment more exciting, all that dumb shit. I was like, these niggas is ops. And I said that because, because it was two white people and a black guy and the black guy, he wasn't friendly or nothing, but it's harder for black people to mask to, to me. I'm saying this to me, like it's harder for black people to mask their intentions around me. So the white people were smiling, happy, you know, very helpful, but it was phony as fuck. The black person just let me know it was super phony because of how it came across when he did it. I was like, oh, this shit's, this shit's over. Like, there's something wrong here. It was almost like we we're being investigated for embezzlement type, if, you know, like narky vibes. But it was, you know, new menu coming out. The fall is coming. Oh. Mind you, this is in February. So they came. They went. Week went by. We got the new menus like they said. We training for it. You know, I'm about to be a waiter now. So that's like 200 to $300 a night. And I bust down the bar. That's another 50 guarantee. So I'm looking at like making $300, $400 a night on a job that's only open for four hours, five hours tops on Saturday. So it's like, it was the illest job, the most money you can make. And the day they promoted me, this nigga shut the shit down. You know how many ASR X pros I had lined up on eBay? Do you know how many SP 303s I was going to buy in a couple of days, my niggas? Like when life hits you with the oopty wopty, it don't even be about the fact that you got to adapt and adjust for real. That really vex you is all that shit you spent. What do they say? You spent all that. You spent the money you didn't have kind of thing. But it, yeah, you kind of have to, though. But it that's the real disappointment. The real disappointment is if I was getting paid one eBay listing per night. Do you know how crazy my summer would have been as a producer when I'm still young and I'm still like ah trying to get it and like, oh. I'm buying, I'm buying this one this week. I'm buying that one next week. You know what I'm saying? That's where my mind was. I was like, oh my God, Va I finally made it to Valhalla and shit. Like this is heaven because back then the equipment, the, you know, the resale equipment on eBay and shit, it was like $300 for everything. Like everything was 300 to $500 and the stuff that was more expensive than that, man, you know, buy me a JV 2020. I don't need a J I don't need an XV 5050. Uh, I don't know if the SP404 was out yet, but the 303 was still, it wasn't, people weren't trying to get it for Dilla or nothing like that. I was trying to get it because that's the first thing I ever bought and I never mastered it. Long story short, class, all them dreams got shattered. Bang, bang, bang. My nigga. That's such a wild year because I was always, uh, this is 2000, I'm talking about 2008, 7, 8. 
It's hold on. Seven. Seven. We're in 2007. Still 2007, you know. Came back from Atlanta. Failed relationship. I won the Little Wayne contest, though. Little Wayne making the next hit, hosted by New York rapper Busy B. It was like two weeks long. I won. I'm the only producer that won. Know that. But whatever, right? That is, you know, people don't know that. I share it with you guys. Who cares? Probably nobody. But I won. That was like the awesome, most awesomest competition musically. You know, getting me out of my shell, introverted type shit. It was dope to win it. So that's all the same year. <laughs> I won that contest, was in that retarded ass relationship. She left me high and dry. Didn't see that coming for the second time. And then boom, I'm at that job and boom, I'm about to get my promotion and boom, I'm just about to get back on track because I just left Atlanta and I just lost the ASR 10. So I didn't get off of that energy. Same fucking year, dog. It's like two seasons later. And so boom, they shut the, they shut the job down. I'm laughing and I decided to walk home. I get real sentimental and nostalgic about my last time doing shit. It's like a ritual to me. So I was like, yeah, I can get a ride and stuff, but I don't want to hear these white girls crying. So I'm going to walk home. This is my last time I'm walking home from this job. And that was significant to me because I was in North Carolina without a car. So those walks everywhere, like a five minute drive is a 45 minute to an hour walk. Know that. So I took that 45 minute hour walk home and the sun was out like, it was winter, so it's February, Marchish. No, it's not cap. Yeah, it is. It's March two thousand. Yeah, it is. God damn, bro, life happens so fast. Yeah, it was February, March when I came back from Atlanta. It was after the Super Bowl, and then it was the March the next year, which would have been two thousand eight, when I'm doing this walk after he shut down the shit. So boom, shuts down the shit. I'm walking home. Sun bright as fuck. So it was like the new season started kind of like right now, like where I'm at currently is mad cloudy and hazy for the past couple of weeks. But now it's like because of the eclipse or whatever, the sun was like out and you could see like the color on the leaves and everything getting brighter around you. It was the same type of movie, except for the doom and gloom of the fact. I need to pay my fucking rent. <laughs> That'd be the doomy gloomy shit about life. It don't even be like, oh, shit didn't work out. I'll be all right. No, it's like. Out of all these stresses I've been through and after all these, you know, cataclysmic resets I go through, niggas still got to pay rent. You know what I'm saying? Like that has been the constant for the most part or or just the concept that money still has to go out to something or someone else. Like you don't get a chance to really just Andre 3000 your reset, like get a flute, sit in the forest, come back home. Your mom made you a pie. And like I didn't have that version of reality. I'm hating. But if I did. But I didn't. So I'm, I'm brainstorming like, yo, how am I going to, uh, survive this, but not in a negative energy, but in a positive one. Like, obviously it's not meant for me to be fucking working all the goddamn time with all these awesome beats on my fucking brain. What else can I do? And I'm talking to God, like, like it's a conversation between you and me and I'm bugging out and I'm laughing at this nigga because he saved this, this fat racist chef named Dan from an ass whooping for real. I said, God, you funny as hell. You shut down the whole shit to make sure I didn't fucking body this nigga for real. You know, I'm just talking to him like I'm talking shit. And I kind of seen like I started getting some revelation on the wisdom and why it was closed down and things like that as time went on. Which So it, it you know, it would have ended regardless. But I felt like my little prayer a few nights prior sped it up. And by the time I got home, you know, this is me beginning dynamic thought book as well, too. This is all around the same time. I had dynamic thought for like a couple of years by then. So I knew how to pray and I knew how to visualize something. But it was I'll be honest with you, it was very hard. Like everyone tells you manifesting, especially in the music space, because I don't think people have these type of com- conversations too heavy in music space. So there's like a 3 a.m. that music producers could resonate with. But it was hard because you know, minimum wage where I was, was, you know, I could try to get another job again at Wendy's or something down the street, but them niggas weren't even hiring me. That was the the weird shit about it. I could walk into a grocery store or a fast food restaurant and get hired the same day just because I get a haircut and dress up and I have a resume that's halfway decent. You know what I mean? Like I, I take it serious, but in this particular season that didn't work for me. And that's when we start seeing the turnover in North Carolina at the time of black employment, uh, black 
workforce in these places to a Mexican workforce in these places. And there's no disrespect to Mexicans. I'm just saying like in real life, Mexicans boxed a lot of us out. And that started around 2007, 2008 in Raleigh specifically. That I'm not saying that's true everywhere, but a lot of those places where it'd be easy for me to get like, like a little side hustle or whatever. Nah, Mexicans was bringing their whole family in on that operation I, from morning to nighttime. I worked with them. I talked to them in Spanish. I saw what they were doing. It's like, oh, that's my sister, Carolina. Oh, yeah. And they put me on Banda de Limon and everything. So, you know, I'm not capping. So that was rough, too. But, you know, nigga, I really didn't want that job. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, it ain't like they they hurt me. But in a way, socioeconomically, kept the minimum wage low for very long, longer, longer than it needed to. I'm talking about at 5 15 an hour. Yeah, that part. So. Wasn't going to pay big boy rent doing that either way, but at least it kept me in motion and I was familiar with it. And, you know, wanting to be familiar and comfortable in your life financially or just survival mode is kind of easy to do. You know, and they tell you as your man, you know, face your challenges and fears and all that. Cool. I think that's awesome to say. But in real life, that's not how it is as a producer, because my real work is happening on my computer or on my workstation. This is just me going through a procedure to make sure I'm not burdening no one else. So I I'd had nothing to prove by working harder in the physical environment. I'm working two jobs. Know that. Like, I remember people used to say that shit to me. So like, well, you should help. If you want a car, you should just hustle. Get you like two or three jobs. Whoop, whoop, whoop. And I was like, on, on low key, high key, in between key, I already got two jobs. Because when I finish working, I'm not crashing out, buying weed, smoking all my money, fucking bitches and trying to go to the club. I'm buying drum kits, samples, vinyl, and I'm trying to make these beats, which sometimes I sell. So I'm always working, even when I don't have a job. Like, you know what I'm saying? Especially when you start making money online and stuff. It's like, once you start making money on music, and and this is kind of a gift and a curse. Once you start making money with your music, you rarely go back to not making music without money. And we'll say that one more time. Once you start making money on your music, the, the 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 logical next step isn't to turn it back to hobby mode. And I'm just talking about the subconscious connection. I'm not talking about how you approach it, your workflow, whether you care or not. I'm talking about just like in the spirit of things. Once you know you can make money, it's on site. So I've been on site since 2003. So I've always been working like in, in terms of, I'm talking about in terms of dedication, energy, showing up like I've been working my whole life, you know, since I was 14, 15 years old, two jobs, technically three, the job or the situations I was in fucking with Dan about to get his ass slapped. The job I had when I came home and dedicated all my time to the fucking bullshit on the forums, you know, reading about EQ and compression and text and trying to get good and beefing with niggas on instant messenger trying to you know exchange files and find secret folders or samples like that was every day like that was my life like that is my life that is my club my club was inquiry into music production for years and years and years and years and years and years so and then the third job be like showing up (laughs) you know making sure i show up in real life for other people because as tragic and weird as my life has been I, it hasn't been really hard for me to find relationships. You know what I'm saying? Like, and in retrospect, a lot of those energies and situations, that was the third job. Like me showing up spiritually as a person, as a friend in someone else's life, even if that, that didn't mean longevity with me and that person, but how I had to show up was a job. You know what I'm saying? Like it was tough because I wasn't smacking bitches. Shout out to second grade Dominique. And I wasn't very, um, I wasn't on it. I wasn't on it like you you ought to be, like you would recommend your friend or your brother to be on it. I wasn't because I already had too many jobs. So it was okay for me. It's like, oh, I'm in a relationship. Oh, I got some, you know, social responsibility and accountability in someone, you know, you know how, you know how the, the ladies are or your relationship counterparts are, even your family. They they somehow or another always find a way to challenge you. And if you're an aware person, like if you care about that, like if you're if you're conscious of what people say to you and it makes you think and feel and want to get better, that type of thing. So I, t- I took that as the challenge. But number one was my day job that was making fucking beats. So 
no matter what was no matter what tornado I was around, as long as my Pentium 4 computer and Fruity Loops was open, I'm good money. Maybe till this day, like low key, like if ever, like if I could be homeless in a tent city as long, I had a Lenovo laptop and Fruity Loops. Like that's it. Like life could be so simple. Like that's the simplest version of producer giving up in life. It's like <laughs> as long as I got a laptop, nigga, like. That's just how it felt. So knowing that. I'm talking shit to God on the way home. And um, you know how it be. Sometimes you hit those spiritual moments or that connectivity moments to your higher self or to the creator or to something else, right? It feels like something else. And you kind of like get this this energy, like everything's going to be all right for real, low key, high key. It's almost like those moments that I kind of describe as volume. It's almost like that when you really get it off your chest with something, the unseen, and nothing happened as, as per usual, right? Like there's no instant turnaround like an eclipse it's 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 delayed and since we're so impatient at times that delay can almost create more anxiety than anything else because it's not like i'm almost 40 i've been shook up by life at least 40 times none of those times god has felt me but each of those times i act like this routine is brand new (laughs) so you know so I get home, I meditate and stuff. I think something cool happened though. I think maybe I sold a beat on PNP worldwide when I got home to kind of let me know everything was all right. And I got a phone call. I think I called somebody to let them know what happened. Yeah. I made a phone call or two. Or did I? I don't even know if I had my cell phone on. I did. I did. I had like one of those sun, something sun service provider, the flat, the flat phones. When everyone else had the pop flip phones, I had like one of these little flat ones with a T9 on it. But I just use it for phone calls. You know, there's nothing else you could do at that time. But um, yeah, I, talk, I remember I remember talking to somebody and whatever. Right. So I had some money, of course, because I was making I was finally starting to make the money. But so I had cash on hand. And I think uh, at the same time, I was like, fuck, it, I'm just going to go to church this Sunday. Like, because I usually worked on the weekends, so I missed church a few times. So, so fuck, I'm going to go to church on Sunday, right? Go to church on Sunday. It is what it is. It's what church is. And out of nowhere, like out of the, out of the clear blue sky as God would have it. Um, I'm telling that story reverse. That's not that story. I should tell you all that story one day, but that's not this story. That that already took place. It's in the same place. Like I see the same cell phone. I see the same living room. So it's all that's true, but that's nine months prior to that. This particular time, I didn't go back to church because of that time I went to church. So nah, let's, let's keep it in 2008. So from February or March of 2008 until October, of 2008 my life went through so many fucking changes and the only thing that kept me in the game like ea sports was this music shit because i went from losing that job trying to figure out how i was going to pay that rent to instead of going to the barbershop the second time i actually went downtown across the street from the barbershop and uh went to the fashion shop like I went to buy like some new clothes or something like a cheap $20 or less t-shirt type shit, some jeans from the Korean type shit. I went to do that move and I went to this place and there was a brother there who was uh, in in this clothing store called Funkies Raleigh next to Top Cap Records, Capitol Boulevard. You hear me? And that brother, I don't know how it got, I don't, I don't know, you know, God works in mysterious ways, no cap, but I don't know how this happened because it doesn't make sense. Like sometimes you'll just be sitting still in a room when shit's all flunked out and you'll get that motion to go do something, right? Because either you're going to sit here, wallow, get depressed and attack yourself and, you know, invert the energy or you pray, let that shit go. And then you get bored. And then in that boredom and in that silence and that calmness, which you need, right? 
all of a sudden you get this impression like I need to go do something. Like if you're out in the streets for real, you might want you need to go fuck something. Or 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 if you into like habits and stuff, you might gotta roll up or drink some drink something. Like it's different for different people, but for me in those moments, none of that works for me. So it's just me. I gotta be bored. Like I'm on punishment. That that's the best. That's the best way. It's not the first day you get on punishment. It's the second or third day you're on punishment, and you know what it is, and you're just bored as fuck. In that moment, you get this impression to go do something. And my impression was to, you know, see to buy a t-shirt or get a haircut like that. You know, take care of myself. Although rent is coming, nigga, and I ain't got no job, so spending that $20 is almost like, you know, I had the prosperity Bible and dynamic thought and shit. So, you know, you trying to test the energy is like, I'm not going to let this make me, you know what I mean? Like, fuck it. This nigga at the uh, clothing store, he asked me something, something about beats. Somehow I had a beat CD on me, which I never did loser. And he, he played it on the spot. Cause that's back when CD players and boom boxes were more common, especially in stores. And he liked the first beat he heard, some sample shit. And uh, long story short, uh, the prayer I had answered, the prayer that answered itself was that I, when I was walking home talking shit to God about saving that, that, fat, that fat guy's life, I was like, so what do you want me to do? Because obviously every time I go to work somewhere, you shut down the goddamn building. Mind you, this ain't the first time shit got shut down. That was like the third time in my life, the place I worked at just shut down. It wasn't like I was fired. It was just here today, gone tomorrow. And then someone move in like two weeks later. It's, it's the crazy, it's crazy to go through that. Um, and this was before the 2008 economic crash that they were gaslighting us said wasn't happening. Yet the guy in Florida shut down his businesses. Yeah, this is this time period, right? And we're in a similar energy now, by the way. Don't miss the dancing bear. Don't miss the dancing sun and eclipse. So that that was turmoil right like if you're a conspiracy person coast to coast am super soldier person because that's me too at the same time part time when i'm falling asleep i'm listening to that shit like i would listen to coast to coast and carrie cassie and shit like i was a nigga a ham operator or a fucking am radio truck nigga camping in the forest like i had to put myself mentally in the woods when i'd listen to that shit like them like them prepper white boys like i was like that in 2005 to eight and stuff like that shit was like listen to ghost stories for real that was like podcasting before podcasting. So I, I put myself in that mind state. Like, I really feel like I'm in a Navajo desert for whatever reason. So this is all, this is all, you know, concurrent with that energy. So I realized that the spirit of the matter was answering me and I had trusted it unknowingly to go to that store, to magically run into that guy to have my CD on me. And I think I got my CD from the barbershop because I stopped at the barbershop first. They had a copy of the CDs or whatever, or in his, in the, in the barber's car or something. And, and for some reason I took it and then I took it to the fashion. Sh- you know what I'm saying? Like it went from point. It, I, I couldn't plan that out is what I'm trying to describe. And then meeting him opened my world to a whole bunch of people who all rap. Cause you know, one thing back then that all rappers had in common, they go to the club. You know, one thing that all the niggas who really go to the club trying to get bitches and be seen try to do, buy some new clothes. So because he was at the clothing store, he would always see the rappers who perform. Because they come there to get their gear or get a shirt or something. You know how that shit go. Or they go to Denim's at the mall, whatever. Like, they they hit the different spots so they could be fresh that Friday or that Thursday night. So he had, like, the Rolodex of all the rappers. But in some hindsight 2020 shit, the conflict was... When he met me, he met a producer who can help his rap dream come true for free because I wasn't charging him. I think I was at first and then I stopped because the decent nigga in me recognized because of him, I'm going to get clientele irregardless. And what I mean is, I'm not even like, I'm not a business first type person. So I'm not even thinking long-term with that. I just knew the nigga logic of it. He want to be a rapper. He wants to be in the scene. He's going to record with me, burn that song on a CD player. And he's going to play it all day at work at that clothing store. Someone's going to ask him, A, where are you recording? But more importantly, B, where do you get those beats from? Because mind you guys, this is 2007, 2008. 
There ain't no Nick Mira, whoever ever tutorial, step by step, click by click. Niggas is still trying to learn how to use the NPC. Don't don't forget where we at. The, the hottest beats is coming off the Korg, uh, the core. I'm sorry, the Rolling Phantom X right now. And niggas is barely mixing and mastering that. They just they just recording it into SoundForge and converting to MP3. We ain't we ain't here yet. So I was so advanced. You know what I'm talking about? Like just the beats were advanced. Let me see. Yeah, y'all don't believe me. I know how that shit go. So we got all these songs coming in at the same time. Don't get it twisted. He got me that song with Nemes from huh? with P Knuckle from the Bay Area. I remember that. That was through him. There goes Raw. Here it is right here. Here goes here goes here goes Summer Love. Now mind you, I didn't say these niggas was Jay Z. Hold on real quick before I play that. Let me check out the chat. Shout out to Mofax. Used to could count on a warehouse job back then. <laughs> Facts. J God. What's good? Peace, brother. Peace. Pat Lee, bro. Sound like Prodigy. He did. Triple D Entertainment. What's good, Tribe? What's good with you? Saturn Saturn Radio STFU Darcy. Hi. We haven't seen Darcy in the chat in a minute. Salute to you, Darcy. Tyrone Sellers, I see you. Greg, the remix, the old song, introduced him. Whoop, whoop. Jay Burke, Jay Alert, the producer. We on site. We cooking up music for real, for real. Bartronized music. I see you, brother. King Well, bang, bang, bang. The worst generation. Oi, put my order in. Oh, you got your notebooks coming? That's what, oh, you, oh, you wrote something down. Me too. I wrote down a little something, something. Just a nice little, you know, a, a symbol and some ideas and some words that made me feel a way. And more so, so that I take advantage of the bookmark of this moment. Like, so two weeks, a month from now, I look back and was like, what did I think and feel on the eclipse? And I write and I look at it and go, oh, that's where my mind, that's where my save, my, my Leon warehouse save state is and how different is life now. And I put the target of May 22nd, you know, 44 days later to check back in on it and see how much it's grown or how much I have grown more than anything. Cause my, my current journey is just self-development, like a certain spirit or demon, you know, if you ask me. There's a certain spirit or demon that I finally. Let me just finish telling this story. All right, cool. So shout out to the worst generation. I'm glad you're getting a notebook or you use the use the use the science. BTW Bartronized Music and Entertainment. I see you. King Well, I see you. King Well says Andrew told me this. I gotta tell you too. Aliens don't have jobs. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Well, we're gonna keep going. So, so this is me and John Raw song. So John Raw had a manager from the Bay Area who was best friends with Malika from making the band four three. No Diddy. Ma, hey, check it. You ever had one of them special summer things? I'm trying to show you how special you are to me. Check it. Let's get fly. Let's ride. Come on. Hey, what, what do you do, Ma? What you say? I wanna know if you could be my summer Hey, what do you do, Ma? What you say? I need to know if you could be my son now. Hey, what it do, do, ma? What you say? You're on my brain. I see you rocking my oh, shit. Hey, baby. Hey, baby. Go, baby. Go, baby. My baby. My baby. My baby. My baby. Hey, what it do, ma? Hey, what you say? We could burn a haze. I'll mix you down with Hennessy. You be my mini mouse. That shit. So it was like a little Ja Rule, J Lo type of thing. Uh, Her boy. <laughs> Jason got her to record that in Oakland. And when he told me, I I didn't believe him. You know, people be like, people back then, especially without the internet and followers to verify people's connections, niggas know everybody for real. Like, that's how it used to be. But Jason was a white dude. And he used to always pass out on my living room floor when I'd be recording because they'd be drinking 40s. So, you know, I didn't, you know, I was like, I don't know about this. I don't know if you know that girl from making a band, whatever. But he did, for real. Like, he really grew up with her. So he called her and she recorded it and they burned a CD because, you know, we didn't have no we share, nigga. I won't know Kim.com mega upload yet for real, for real on the on the wares and piracy side. Niggas held that down. But on the studio collab side, we we just weren't there yet because someone might steal the email. Lord forbid. So they burnt it to a CD and they sent me to stems, the acapellas. And I was like putting that shit in my session. And of course, it doesn't line up. And I'm like. What is the timing of this? So I had to like listen to her ad libs in time and I aligned it harmonically in my head to the ad libs of the sample when it was like, ooh, doo, doo, doo. like I thought she was following that 
I sent that shit back to them. And she's like, oh, no, you guys have it too early or late or something. I was like, oh, y'all on that blue face shit for real. Because this nigga, um, the other nigga that John Raw introduced me to, um, he rapped off beat too and it fucked with me and they try to get me to fix it. I was like, I can't fix it. I don't know why Bay Area California people don't like rapping on a goddamn snare. Cautious steps. I haven't fucking met an artist yet nope. who mastered the art of death. So we celebrate life. I used to meditate nights trying to get the shit right. Now I take flight. Came from the dirt, saw more dirt. What hurt the most fueled my thirst. What hurts the most want to fuel like that flow, that pocket, that cadence. I can't, I can't get with that. No, no. I grew up on Jay Z, so like, yeah, bro. It, it that was stress. I'm getting ahead of myself though. So, a lot of my uh, my want to be a producer, right? Because that's what I was manifesting. I never used the word beatmaker. I was a nigga on the internet arguing the difference between beatmaker and producer. And how I'm a better beat maker than all your favorite producers. Like, that's been my attitude since I was a kid. So, but my manifestation was I wanted to be a super producer. I didn't want to be a beat maker. I didn't, you know, I wanted to be in the studio when my song is being crafted. So I did not know that I had put an order in with the universe to go through the training camp for that. Since, you know, I didn't get into the, uh, what was it? Full Cell University and all them shit, them digital art schools. Durham had one, the digital circus we had near Wake Forest. Like I got accepted to them, but I just didn't have the financial aid to go. So we're going to have to get some on the job fucking training. And he was really the portal opener for that moment. And I've recorded so many rappers like this is just a, this, this is just a, piece of that like all of that all of this this 2008 folder just this alone was my introduction through him to these different rappers but the thing about it is those those are just the songs that i kind of thought was all right if i go back to my recording folder studio sessions i have some more shit here i had a kid from alabama we made his first beat cd together like he would work at ups and bring me a couple of dollars to show him how to make beats on fruity loops so we did his first beat cd he was on some big crit type shit. Um, I recorded mad people. Like, is all I'm saying. It's like, I, I recorded people, got songs with different people. The ones that I created folders for, those are the ones that would come back multiple times or pay a lot of money. So, you know, I had, you know, a little Ponzi, a little, a little situation going on where I could fucking, like these niggas, I think these are all bloods from, uh, it's an RC Wolf gang. He said he's from California. I don't know nothing about that but they would sign my autograph. I had like a white, not a whiteboard, but I took a bunch of white pieces of paper, printer paper, and taped them above my uh, mantle on my fireplace. And every time a rapper came over, I would have them sign it on some rap city in the basement type shit. And so when the blood signed it, I think blood signed, they do something. They do, they, these niggas, the, these niggas did something. And then I had uh, the other niggas right here it was a gang of Crips ran by ran by a Mexican brother. But all the other Crips are black. <laughs> These guys, it uh it, they have a song called NBA Money. I don't want you, I don't want you to miss the fucking dancing bear. You know what I'm talking about? So anyway, these NBA young boy ass niggas have a song called NBA Money. So, but they're Crips and folk. Don't have that. Listen, I'm not into the politics, so that, you know, you're just just forward in the news, nigga. I think they were both. I think like black flag in blue flag. I don't know. I think that's how that happened. So when they signed their names, they did that for, they did the fork or something. So when the bloods came back the next weekend, they saw the graffiti or the, the sigils. And then they just kept going. They were beefing with each other with paper and pen. I did not know what I know now that those are sigils for real. And if they're banging on each other, because that's what it's called, then it's is mustering a certain type of magic, a seal, a work. I ain't know that. But I quickly and I listen to me. This this is probably how I got into 3 a.m. low key, high key off of some gangbangers doing their graffiti sigils is because after I met all of them niggas, that's when my life got fucking nuts, specifically in that stu studio. It was really just a, a loft apartment. So, um. Strike one. Anyway, I'm paying my rent, obviously. March, April, May, Mo. And 
Nigga, it ain't even go that far. Don't you hate life? So, like, I much rather had had the $300 a night and buy everything off of eBay hustle. But I'll settle for not working with racist people and just recording niggas and paying my bills until God shows me something bigger and better. God never showed me nothing bigger and better in that instance. Because whatever that energy, spirit, universe, whatever you want to call it, I'm just going to use, I'm going to say God just to keep it short and, and simple. But when I describe God, I'm, I'm talking about like this divine guiding force that seems to be correspondent to my feelings, thoughts, and, you know, the, my narrative of my personal life. You know what I'm saying? I feel like I'm bouncing it off of this proverbial God wall. So that's what I mean by that. So I'm asking God like, yo, bro, like I ain't got no motion out here. I ain't got no bitches. I ain't got no car. All I'm doing is making beats and when I'm not making beats, I'm recording and I'm paying my bills and, you know, I'm on a, I'm on a low budget diet. You know what I'm saying? Like, what's up? Like, when is this shit going to change for real? So through those three months, February, March, April, May, I think it's May, just three to four months, all four of those rents I pay off of just recording niggas for $30 an hour. And then I make some extra money if they use my beats. A lot of people, when they first meet you at a home studio, they bring beats with them from some industry shit. But then people started hearing my beats because I could do the South-ish and the Soul East Coast stuff at the same damn time. So that opened up my possibilities and type of rappers I could work with dramatically in my R&B too. All three actually. So the Down South, the Up North, and R&B. I did all three. And uh, so I had singers, rappers, gangsters, whatever. So woo woo. They doing these sigils now. Straight in my living room. And then this is like a weird sense of unfortunate events. I recognize I had manifested that moment. I just kind of want to show you all that picture. But I look like a fucking nerd. But anyway, I'll show you. Hold on. Let me see if I can find it. If I can find it, I'll show you the time period. There's no cap in my rap. I don't know who this story is going to help at a time like this, but. I wish someone was talking to me back then. Or someone who wasn't fucking trying to use me, I should say. Let's let's be more specific. There we go. That guy, he was the one that went through all that. That's exactly the studio. That's my Evolution MK, MK2 keyboard, the best MIDI controller uh, keys response ever. Old ass clankety clank keyboard, a Dell flat screen, allegedly some M Audio BX8s. I had the, uh, I don't even think I had my Sapphire 6 yet. I think I was still on the Emu 1212M inside of my computer on the PCIe slot. And I had a fan in front of my red, uh, so I had a red computer on the floor with a Pentium 4 with like four gigabytes of RAM in 2008. And I had a fan, a box fan to keep it cool because the internal fan wasn't doing shit for it no more. Um, so my computer was on its last leg. During that same time, since I was starting making some money, I was like, well, the first thing I want to do is upgrade my RAM. My, uh, Neighbor had a, a Mini Cooper that said like tech tech nerds or tech boys or some shit on it. So I was waiting to catch him slip and ask him how much it would cost to put RAM in that computer and, you know, replace the power supply and all that cool shit. But I didn't have the opportunity to meet him yet, but I, it was in the back of my mind, just like the ASR fixing the RAM. But I had to fix the RAM on my computer, too, because now we got Nexus. Now we got Omnisphere. So you already know that how that story got to go. I got four gigabytes of RAM. Don't forget recording all these niggas, making all these beats. So I don't know how I did it. It could be nothing but God for real. Cause technically I couldn't do that much recording and tracks now with logic. And I got over 40 gigabytes of Ram and my computer act like no nigga. So I had four, <laughs> but I guess our plugins and our VSTs weren't that heavy back then either. So, but anyway, so, you know, it's like Omnisphere one Nexus one, but, um, What the fuck happened? So it just shit just got bad real fast, y'all. And I and when I said to you what when when I started adding the months to this, I realized how short and how fast this shit happened. By May, someone tried to kill me. 
let, let's just let's just get through it. Let's just let's just get to the tough part. So by May, um, in this right here where I'm sitting is the bottom of a loft. It's just a living room. To the left is a double sliding screen door. I have that shit cracked open looking in the backyard. There's some apartments across the way, but if you look at a certain angle, you just see grass and trees. And that's when I listen to my coast to coast and I use that as my visualizing point, like I'm in a forest or in the woods. And I had a futon behind me. I had an upstairs level that was half the size, but I didn't have any furniture or nothing because, you know, niggas. And um, I had a kitchen, bathroom upstairs. I had a stand up washer and dryer to the right of me on the other side of the stairs that go upstairs, right? So it was very small intimate type of space to the left is the backyard to the right is the front door right and everything spiritually i could sense shit getting dark real fast and it was off the strength of me recording because remember i said earlier the guy i met that kind of opened up the door to all these people um his shit was he was trying to create momentum and he kind of wanted to kanye west me in the sense that and this is me assuming I don't, I don't know his words or narrative. I'm just, I'm just talking about the feeling and how it played out. It felt like, like jealousy or envy entered the chat on someone's part, but y'all know how I am. I'm kind of straight face nihilistic. Like nigga, what are we tripping on? Like, I got you. I'll record you, but I need to record these niggas first because my bills are due. I'm not vexing you about money and you ain't got no money to help me with bills. We have a working relationship. It's cool. I ain't going nowhere. You know exactly where the fuck I am. I ain't got a fucking car. So what are we, what are we talking about? So that's, that's something. And in that, some interpersonal drama, because there's a female rapper, you know, when the female rappers enter the chat and the female rapper is a regular, you know, people start thinking and feeling things. And, you know, especially if they, feel a way about that female rapper. Now, mind you, full disclosure, I didn't. Me and her were cool as shit. I ain't going to say her name or nothing. She was older. And one of her baby daddy, boy, I think it was her baby daddy. Her baby daddy was uh, this brother named Shook the Crook. And if you're from Raleigh, you probably already know who I'm talking about. So I'm with uh, Shook the Crook's baby mama because <laughs> he was locked up, but he was getting out. Shook the Crook was like a crip, I think. Yeah, he was a crip. And so... So the gang culture where I'm from, we didn't become aware of it until I was in high school. Shout shout to uh, Calypso, enter the chat, uh, live long and prosper. Uh, so around 2002 to 2004, you hear about the gang culture, like lighting up in, in Raleigh. And Shook the Crook was like the main one. Like he was a crip that was a rapper and he goes to the club on the South side and have that shit shut down because it'd be mad people, you know, people, people. And uh, so he got caught up in something, got put away for a couple of years. So at this time, he's away. But that's her dude. And all the people that fuck with him in the city musically, you know, she so she knew people, too, through him. So that was how I played it. But there's some other stuff going on. Right. And and there's and they're working together like her, him, him and him. Like it's almost like a. Normally, when you record often enough, regularly enough with people, you start to have like that group forms. You know what I'm saying? So. I felt the energy opening up to something like that, where it's going to be more of a collaborative thing. Um, we did all do a show together in like Burlington, North Carolina, leading up to what, April. So that shit was weird because it was a girl's night with male strippers. <laughs> What's up with me? Every, every time a nigga like me go out to the club, there's like some niggas waiting. Like I've never had a cool club story where it doesn't end in like dick and penis somewhere pause like nah for real i went to miami nothing but trannies i went to atlanta the first, before we got to strokers it was the gay night at some other cool club that was supposed to be heterosexual like it, everywhere i go it, it, you know i gotta learn how to eq and compress because obviously this ain't this this life ain't my life so they performed there and then as soon as the performance was done we went home and uh so that was cool they got paid for it and it was more serious. They're trying to get on radio interviews, uh, college. I had my brother, my bro worked at NC state's college, 88 point, whatever, all types of shit like that. And, um, it was going bro. But like I said, in the background, you can feel pressure. You can feel the energy change. Something changed. I don't know what changed, but I don't care because I'm trying to survive. You, you hear me? So the gang bangers writing on the wall. I bought a Mac. G4. 
at some point during this situation, when things were starting to light up for me, I had a couple hundred dollars that I could spend. And I was reading this book, Dynamic Thought. Hold on. Let me see if I can find it. Because there's no cap in my rap. You feel me? Like. Right here. Thank God I took a picture of it. You can't read it, of course. But that's Dynamic Thought. That's the Evolution MK and that's the Roland XV 2020. And uh, so I was reading it and I was like, why am I trying to save my money and buy this Mac? Why don't I try to manifest it? Sure has got me green apples, y'all. Y'all can't make this shit up. I go to the barbershop randomly, right? And like I said, the gang culture was alive and well by 2008. But what I had not realized was that Raleigh during this economic, you know, housing crisis was was had a wave of breaking and enterings, but they did not alarm the city by running news stories about it. So you didn't know what was happening. You would just hear things. So there's a string of breaking and enterings and homes and home invasions going on during this time period. Um, you remember this is like the first time niggas got a stimulus check. Like it was all during that era. And um so niggas would be selling shit at the barbershop. This dude took out a Mac G4 out of his trunk and was like, I sell it to you for like, I don't even want to lie to y'all. But I'm pretty sure I bought it for less than $150. So red flag, of course. But everyone around me was looking like, you know, good deal. You know what I'm saying? It's like, they don't know what a Mac G4 is. They don't know what a Mac G4 means to a nigga that can now use Logic 8 and do his beats, you know, like that. They don't know what a G4 is to a nigga that has a Pentium 4 computer that's dying. And, you know, they don't know what that means for real. So to me, it meant everything. But the problem was it didn't work with my monitor, keyboard or mouse because fucking Apple. So I had it in my in my living room. Awaiting for me to get a little extra funds so I could put that studio together and really get shit popping. Because why? I have this super group forming, right? I'm recording more. I'm getting better. And I'm making custom beats now, which is new for me. Like I'm making beats with the person next to me type of thing. So I need more power and I'm praying logically towards that. Universe brought it into my fucking lap. Literally. I I honestly, bro, the more I say 150 to you, I really feel like I only gave that nigga $80 for real. Something's telling me it was like 80, 120, something low. Anyway. So I got that. Now I just got to get the accessories and, and, and see if it worked. I don't even know if it worked. I know it turned on, but I don't know if it like when you turn it on, can I sign in? Can I scratch it? Can I reinstall? Like, I don't know how to use Mac yet. It's just hope. You know, it's like having the ASR in Atlanta against the wall until I got the power supply. Same, same, same fucking loop, dog. So my, mind you, I was just in Atlanta. I was. That's what frustrates me when I tell this story again. I was just in Atlanta the year before. So it wasn't like this is like a new path. This is the same path. It's just a dusty version of it. Cause had I stayed in Atlanta when I did, I would have ended up in a situation when I was working at Mud Knox studio on Brahma brothers road and that whole situation he had pop in, which ended up being parlayed to drugs beats D R U G S with the periods, drugs beats. Literally the two weeks I was supposed to come back and I didn't Mud Knox ran into drugs beats. And then the rest is history. That shit, that shit, it don't hurt really because it's not possible. It's not a possibility of mine. It just makes you feel a way that whatever would have been for me would have been for me. But to know that it was real and I missed it. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you, you know what I'm talking about? It was, it's like, thank God for Brother Mudnock and how he boosted my confidence by hyping up my beats, maybe more than anyone in my life. But to know that when he offered me something and what his game plan was for his studio C or whatever, and putting the, he had the MPC 2000 in there, you know, I was about to be in heaven at the ASR 10 at home. All I had to do was wait two more weeks and bring it back to the studio. Well, this is before the dude came back and took it and, and whatever the case may be, it would have been, I, right, you know, on a production side, I got way much, way better, way faster and had a fucking engineer in 2008, bro, 2007, 2008. I, I would have had all of that. And um, personal life, family life, all that shit be damned. Um, I ended up back here in this situation. So, you know, I got the Mac G4, the same Mac G4 I saw at Mudnock Studio. You, you see the vision. So I'm just recreating 
the reality that should have been, could have been on some, on, on some, on some, um, H-E-R and Bryson Tiller shit. So obviously this thing is stolen, right? But when you buy stuff like that, you don't think about that. And that happened. Nothing happened, but I just know that that's in my, in my living room at this time. And then, um, there's one more thing. Cause you know, it's always a fucking trifecta of fuck fuckery before the, before the, before the launch. There's one more thing that I did that was out of order. Mind you, I'm taking accountability for these decisions. I let these game bangers <laughs> write messages back and forth without just taking the paper down. I bought a hot computer in hindsight. I really didn't know. Cause that was my first time experiencing that, but I knew. And then I also, there's some other shit happened. Uh, maybe, maybe I said something wrong. I don't know. So I did. I, this is on me, right? Like in, in spirit. More than a club. You always at a crossroad. Come on now. He said he sound like Cameron. That's how it is in LA. <laughs> Starstruck says, bro, I ain't had no bitches. I've been there. Come on now. Can, can I get a witness? You know, you having no bitches in 2008 when the music is good is different. But um, anyway, fucking uh, uh whatever. I kind of know what the third thing is. I kind of know, like, because because I know the whole story. No, I don't know the whole story now. I know most of the story now in hindsight. There's another rapper, of course, during this time who's working with me, too. And he kind of wants me to be his producer, too. He's like, you know how people are like, yo, me and you, we're going to put this project out and we're going to Hollywood, man. We're going to blow up. Woo, woo, woo. So it's a lot of that. Almost everybody said that to me because I think they wanted free beats, but that's OK. But some some meant it. Some some relationships and connections lasted a little bit longer than that. So that's all during that time. And uh, I have another folder. Don't play with me, boy. Don't you don't you dare be cute and clamorous. Yeah, I can just tell by these songs. The story is in it. All right. So May happens. And what happens is nothing happening. But I had to give you those those parts of that story in case your life presents you with similar doors or you recognize a certain similar pattern or energy in your life, you can kind of see where the exit ramps are. Right. Um, I think I kind of ignored and overlooked a lot of these things in hindsight because I was using the law. Like I was learning law of attraction. So of course someone wants to give me a G4. Of course someone wants to give me an ASR 10. Of course, like, of course, like they may not know I asked for this, but I know and my, my invisible whiteboard know this all makes sense. It's nonetheless shocking when it happens. And I want to point that out. Like when I prayed, when I was walking home, when that job got shut down a few months prior in February, I didn't know how this shit was going to map out, but everything I said mapped out. I'm going to do that one more time. When I'm talking to the big homie in the sky about what I would like to see and how I would like for it to happen or whatever. Like I wasn't as detailed as you should be, I guess, but I, I, I always, you know, I'm, I'm easy to get along with. Ask God, like, God, I don't need nothing super duper specific, but if we could loosely follow these three things, I think I'll be contento. So I was always like hum humble in my requests enough. And uh, so when these things appeared in my life, I was like, amen, for real, like, duh, like I asked for it. So that took three, four five months for it to get peak and. I'm hanging out with old boy. I was telling you about just a couple of, a couple, a couple of days, maybe prior to this event in May, I went to a club downtown Raleigh and I didn't know it was a club. It's not like a real club. It's like a, you know, how downtown main streets are. You have like those booth stores, mom and pop shop. They used to be mom and pop shops. Someone converted one of these into like a club, I guess. And the spirit and energy there was dark as all get out. It was hip hop, I guess. This is like before trap became trap. And I just remember being in there and how dark it was. Like nobody had the light on. I don't mean dark like lights off. I mean dark like the spirit, the atmosphere was dark. And the lights were off. And like there was this kid who I know now, who I know who he is now, but then I didn't know. To me, he was a kid because it felt like he was 16, 17. He had sunglasses on in this dark place smoke everywhere 
because everybody was in pussy and tells you you can't stop smoking yet. And they were drinking, of course. And he's performing this very low vibrational song. And I couldn't connect to it, but I saw all the girls and the women and the boys and the, and the, and the hood niggas kind of just standing there almost like in a trance, dog. I kind of felt like I walked in on a vampire club of niggas circling around someone feeding on someone. That's the energy it felt like. It felt like a scene from Blade, but it was just hip hop or rap or whatever. And I was like, this is weird. So, you know, I kind of put my back to the fuck shit and get close to the exit. <laughs> no one messing with me. It's just that, you know, I don't resonate in that frequency. So I know I don't belong. So the guy, the rapper I was with, he was excited about it because he was trying to network and politic because there's other rappers there. And this is, this is like the final stage boss, you know what I'm saying? But for him, he was way more comfortable with the street life than I was. So for him, it was illogical. For me, it was like, this ain't the energy you want for nothing. I'm from up north. I ain't forget. <laughs> so I remember leaving that club and this big dude, and I'm a big dude. So like a big dude to me is a big dude. This big dude, maybe 6'6", six, six, bro. I don't know. 6'6", six, six, 350, like big dude. And he rapping. He's only like four years older than me. But he's like, yeah, man, you got a studio? I'm like, yeah. Woo, 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 woo. So I don't think nothing of it because I have these conversations every time I'm with rappers. So like I meet people all the time that can rap and want beats. So to me, I didn't think I would see him again for real. A couple days later, he called. And I don't know what's going on at this point. I know the Crips are supposed to come over and we're supposed to finish their mixtape. And I got mad money, but they keep trying to pay me in weed. <laughs> and I don't smoke weed yet. So I was like, no, nah, I kind of need the money. And I'm making their custom beats and all that shit's about to happen on a Saturday. So I know my rent's about to be paid. Friday, I think, is the day he calls me. And it's just extra money at that point. Like $40 maybe I'll make. Maybe I'll make 50 Maybe I'll order some pizza tonight. You know, we didn't have Uber yet and we didn't have no fucking DoorDash yet. So, you know, options were limited. And... He started calling me uh, like early in the day. He was like, hey, man, you know, I want to record something. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Um, Where you live? And I was like, I live here on the north side. He was like, bet. Call back like an hour later. Yeah, man, I'm on my way still. But real quick, where you live at? I'm on the north side. All right, bet. You know, no. And then the, the frequency of the calls were weird. So it already put my spider senses off. I don't know why. Because like when you're busy creating or you busy surviving and creating because, you know, you're doing two things at once. You're not really thinking like someone's trying to set you up in real time. Like it's usually like you learn the pattern and avoid it. But when it happens the first time, you don't know it. Know it. Luckily for me, though, I watched The Wire. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> no, but I grew up in a in a household that, for whatever reason, all different branches of my family gravitated towards, like, The Wire or gravitated towards, like, these hood dramas and these hood nigga situations. So I had clocked that the only other time I've been familiar with this signal was indeed in a TV show or movie. And it's like them trying to triangulate you as they're planning out their thing. And that's a scary thought to have. No Call of Duty. But I've recorded so many people and more importantly, I've recorded so many more dangerous people that it didn't that he didn't move me. You know what I'm saying? Like it wasn't he was a big guy, but it wasn't like I couldn't break his fucking knees. So he didn't put me on. He didn't put me on my dean like he should have anyway. And, and, and mind you now, mind you now, mind you now, this is assuming he's connected to what I'm about to tell you, but I'm going to fucking connect him. So he comes over comes over at nighttime though we supposed to record by four o'clock the sun's supposed to still be out we would have been done in less than two hours the sun still would have been out he he came through when the sun was setting you know keep your eyes on this producers and engineers don't let these niggas play with you and uh so he come through in the school he knocked and now because it's so much later than we originally anticipated it's about to run into another studio session i have so Friday nights, instead of me partying and bullshitting, the older homies who rap or whatever, they'll come over and drink and smoke at my spot. But since I was sober, I was kind of like a safe house. You know what I'm talking about? So I knew certain people were going to come that night. So 
because he pushed that shit back to like six, seven, eight o'clock, I don't know, whatever is the sunsets in the spring. I knew what we was going to run into my other people. So because of that, I knew we was going to be okay. You know, we, we ain't got to worry about no Indians here. Cause there's going to be plenty of Cowboys in my living room. If you catch what I'm saying to you, but as God would have it, as fate would have it, that session didn't run over into shit. What had happened was he came over. He brought another person to the studio unannounced. Rule number one, engineers, producers, people working from home, never, ever, 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 let a nigga come into your dwelling and bring a plus one unannounced. Like, that's common in some cases, especially with your friends and people being cute and little girls in a family who want to sing and dance and bring their friends. That those That's kind of expected. But on some real trill shit, like when you're making money and living, like I'm not going to say living off of it. Fuck that shit. I never lived off of music. I survived off of music. It's a different it's a different energy. When you're in that moment of your life where you're surviving like that, never let nobody bring no negative, no extra nigga with them. OK, just just take my word for it. Shout out to Mofax. He said, I got a computer given to me to write papers for college, and it happened to have Fruity Loops. The rest is history. Ain't that how that happened? And Jay Cooper says, greeting, brothers. You really need to start writing these stories down and scrapbook it to compile a book for the record of these times. Oh, don't worry, buddy. We got we got AI, don't we? AI will be able to go through my channel and write the book for me, low-key, high-key, but we don't have the uh, the technology or the, uh, I guess, the workflow app third-party thing isn't there yet, but it will be. And I'll consider that because I got other stories I never told that I can also do that too. So Lord willing, my dumb ass live long enough. I can do that. So it's a great idea. Plus one NJ Cooper. I appreciate that. Shout out to starstruck. Shout out to Antonio McKinney in the building. I see you. We mentioned you early. Triple D entertainment says you aren't a midget at six, four. They needed a plus one. You see, you see the vision, you see the vision. So he came through, he brought a midget with him though. He brought a little nigga with him, but this little nigga was dark. You know, what's funny about it. This nigga by himself, like the guy he brought with him, didn't strike me as a dangerous, bad person. He struck me as a poor hood person and maybe a poor hood person that steal. Like thieves have a certain spirit about them, like liars and thieves, like people who pretend to be your friend and rob you or set you up. Like they have a certain spirit or odor. Um, And he had it, but I didn't know what it was yet. I just so far few in between. But. What it spoke to me when I saw him was because the first thing I had a conversation with these niggas was like, what side of town y'all from? Like, it's that loud. Like, I could tell what side of town he's from. So he was like, yeah, I'm over there. I said, oh, word. I got a cousin that stayed at Heritage Park. So I'm trying you late and where they from. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I used to go to whoop, whoop, whoop. I was like, oh, I know where you at. I know where you from. I mean, like, because they're at my spot on the north side, but I know where they're from based on the call signs of the streets and the neighborhoods. Like, you know how niggas politic. And I knew how to politic like that. Like, all right, so these are niggas from the South Side. Know that. These are niggas near Heritage Park. Know that. So, but not very useful information. I just, I'm a, I'm a niggaologist. I be studying shit. So the next red flag was he had the plus one. And the plus one didn't rap. Because I asked him, I was like, what, you rap or something? Like, he's like, no, no, no. Like, he wasn't very talkative. He would, And he wasn't disrespectful or nothing either, which is the most alarming thing about this story. Like, the guy I would think, like, if you're playing a game of Clue or Carmen San Diego, you would think it was this nigga that, you know, was the ringleader of some fuck shit. But he seemed so out of it. At the And, and, and the other thing that was weird about him, because I didn't know niggas did drugs. I know niggas did drugs, but I didn't know niggas did those drugs. So so what, was, what really set me off is, A, the dude who wanted to rap didn't know what beat he wanted to rap on. Red flag. And he didn't want a custom beat. He started thinking of fucking industry instrumentals. And he was like, uh, can you get the uh, Usher Love in This Club beat? And I'm like, mixtapes are cool and all, my nigga. But who the fuck is rapping on a Usher beat? Like, are you serious? Like, my spider senses was going crazy because it was just a most flagrant, retarded ass instrumental. So I got to go find Polo to Don instrumental, J arms, mixtape and all that dumb shit, put it in Ableton. I'm ready to go. But while I'm doing all that, I'm, I'm clocking the brother behind me on a futon, the other nigga from somewhere else. And he's just sweating. And his eyes are dilated. My living room was dark because the sun's starting to set. And I think in hindsight, either ecstasy or blue dolphins do that to you pause or uh perks 
And like I said, I was kind of green to that shit. I didn't know that shit made it down there and niggas was doing it on that level. But he he had like a a drug reaction going on. So, you know, that that put uh, paranoia in me because I didn't, you know, I don't like people on drugs. Like, it fucks with me. So, whatever, right? Like, it is what it is. This nigga obviously don't know what he want to do. So, let me hurry up and just get this shit done. Like... I ain't got to worry about, you know, flying hooks and setting up doubles and tri- like this nigga just want to be cute and clamorous. Cool. Let's get this over with because it don't feel right. But two, I have other shit to create later. I'm going to preserve my energy. Ten minutes into this shit. Someone's knocking on the door. As soon as we start hitting record, mind you, the nigga behind me sweating and being weird. He on his phone looking like he's seen a ghost. Know that. And, um, but the dude standing next to me on the microphone, standing, rapping, he's just, it's kind of conspicuous how the rap game be. He's just, he rapping like, um, Biggie and them on a fucking Ursher beat. And I, to this day, that's the worst part about this whole story. Like the nigga could have picked such a better song to do if you're going to pretend to do a song. And that's how it felt like. So the nigga knock on some other third party nigga knock on the door and I stop and I, and I didn't even stop recording. It's still recording. The nigga behind me don't even lift his head. Like, I'm the only one that heard someone knocking on the door type of energy. Like, I'm walking through a dream and no one hears that. No one knocking on the door. Mind you, the door is right there. Like, four four arm lengths away from me to the right on the other side of a staircase in the closet. So, he's still, he's, I still had the recording. He was still rapping as the nigga was knocking and all the transaction was going on. Uh, I looked through my door door uh my peephole and it was covered and i was like oh this my nigga being silly because the nigga i'm waiting to come in an hour and a half or so he does dumb shit like that so i thought it was him because i thought it was him wrong the nigga so but i still ask who is it and because he never answered I have this thing when I open doors that I put my foot on the bottom of the door. Like, uh, so like if you crack your door and you put your strong leg toe at the edge of the door so that if anyone try to push it, it hits your leg, it hits your toe, it hits, it hits your foundation. So they can't just bust in. They got to push it past your strength of your leg. Right. And I've always opened doors like that, like sideways or almost like, you know, wedged like i always open doors especially if you don't know who it is you just because it's not even just like the danger of someone trying to hurt you it's just like you open it and whatever like you don't know what the fuck's going on so i do that and i see briefly through the through the crease that's open for me to see who it is and i'm expecting one face and then my brain is like disarrayed because it's not that fucking face and then you go through the second disarray because you see a gun and then you go through a third disarray it's because like wait Why is there a nigga with his face covered with a gun in front of my door? And then you go through another disarray when you're like, wait, I got to react to this shit. I ain't trying to get shot. Not with no fucking Usher love in this club beat playing. No fucking way. I am not going out like that. On my tombstone, his last song was Polo to Don instrumental, really produced by Hit Boy and Chasing Cash with a fat guy rapping. Like no one, no one wants their discography to end like that, dog. So the nigga's little. He he wasn't ready for this assignment. So he tried to push the door past my foot and he couldn't. It just, it said, he he tried to push it with like, with the shotgun. He tried to lead in with the shotgun and it said, Poop. and he was like, get back, nigga, get back. I was like, no, <laughs> my silly ass. I said, no, <laughs> like what the, what the fuck? This ain't no, I am not motherfucking um, Lawrence Fishburne. This, I ain't Joni Mitchell, nigga. This ain't a movie. I'm not Makai Pfeiffer, nigga. I'm not listening to you. If you want this, you're going to have to work for it. You're going to have to sweat. And because I knew it was a shotgun, I, you know, I took physics. So I knew like, I got to get away from this door if he shoots the lock or the door, but he can't point it at my face no more because he can't get the gun through the crack because he a weak little bitch. Awesome for me. But I couldn't close the door either. <laughs> so I'm holding the door. Like, I'm like that nigga off fucking uh, Game of Thrones. Hold the door. Hold. I'm holding the fucking door. Mind you, this whole thing is going. And now there's a shouting match at my door with a gun on the other side of it. And the nigga's still rapping on Love in This Club. He's still rapping like he don't feel. like. And, and this is the thing. We're talking about black people now. There's a black guy sitting on the couch on a 
tr- a cheap ass cell phone with no Facebook or apps, acting like he's in his own mushroom zone. You got a nigga rapping on a terrible instrumental who's not making a good song because we don't even know what the hook is yet. And all of that heat, spiritual heat that you would get when something's wrong, you know, when everybody knows something's up by the time the spider senses reach everybody, they never responded to the shit. Maybe with like, I don't know, you know, sometimes that shit feel like you're in that moment forever. It was a long, short moment, but I was scared of not necessarily getting hurt or anything. I was scared because I didn't know what was happening. Like, because like, as you're going through your nigga moment, you're like, wait a minute, these niggas ain't responding. Are they part of it? So then you have to like, like now I got to turn into Steven Seagal. You know what I'm talking about? And I haven't practiced my Steven Seagal shit in a minute. So I don't know if I can take the big nigga in the gun at the same time. I, I got to do one at a time. I can't do, I'm not, I'm not like that. I'm, I'm good. I'm good for one or the other. I'm not good for both at the same time. I don't think I haven't had that training with Keanu Reeves or nothing. I know I can pop his kneecap. No problem. This little nigga, if he got weapons, that's going to be a toss up. He can, he, he can sneak up on me, but the nigga with the gun, with the fucking Yosemite Sam, I don't think I really have to worry about that, but niggas in fear might still squeeze. So I got to be mindful of buckshot. It's a lot. It's a lot to process. So eventually Dorothy on the microphone gets off the microphone and it's almost like you're watching a skit or something. It's like he takes the headphones off and like his pants drop a little bit. He has to pull his pants up and he runs to the door and he's big. He's 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 bigger than the biggest I've been. Like he was huge and he slammed against the door. And he was like, what's that? What happened? And uh, he got freaked out. Or he acted freaked out because he saw the rope swinging through my door. See, the the guy on the other side of the door had a shotgun and a rope. Like They thought this was some fucking HBO classic or something. Like, they're going to tie niggas up. And it's weird because even if he did decide to tie me up with a rope, which good luck with not getting your fucking head punched off, is that that's not enough rope for three people. He couldn't do nothing with that rope. If someone put him onto a lick and there's a six foot four nigga me in a session going with X amount of rappers, that little rinky dink piece of rope can't do nothing. You don't know how many people are in that house. You know what I'm saying? And that's why I think the person in my house has something to do with this, because like I'm not in an area where these niggas exist and nor can you scout me because it's not my setup ain't like that. You know, there's no fancy car in the front. The only thing you could probably notice as a passerby is that I have traffic on the weekend of random niggas coming through, but they're the same niggas. So, you know what I'm saying? It's not like a, it's not like a club. It's like, okay, Friday, these people come Saturday. These it's like that. It's not a whole bunch of traffic. So he didn't clock it. Someone told him something, 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 something. I connected it to the niggas inside. It just seemed that their energy, everybody, everybody must see energy matched. So luckily the door is closed. My adrenaline was full tilt. I ran to my staircase after I closed the door, just in case he was trying to shoot it. And finally, the nigga on the couch got up. I told him to get upstairs. And I called the cops. And in the midst of all of that, the cops sent like 15, 20 agents to my house. And they searched my house. I have the recording. I have the direction and I have the description of the person who just tried to strong arm rob my house. You're in the middle of a crime wave. And what they decided to do was check my chimney for drugs. They didn't give a fuck about me. They didn't give a fuck about my life. They didn't give a fuck about what I said. They automatically typecast at me as, oh, If you're around these niggas, you must be selling drugs. Y'all, y'all don't young chop. You know, y'all never heard of Lex Luger, nigga. Like y'all never heard of like rappers be having producers for real. You said with a gun is not strong arm. What is it called? R&B Garvey. MG Snipes. That's hilarious. Face I see so wow. Slow motion type. It was slow motion. Mofax says this sounds just like real life. Oh, well. It is real life. Haru said, is this scary or funny type beat? Haru says, this don't sound like real life. And Mofax says, this sounds just like real life. (laughs) I get it. I get it. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it don't say it wouldn't sound real. It, you don't, it don't sound real. So, so anyway, long story short, the cops are harassing me on some shit, talking about they'll get back to me. Mind you, I have the forensic recording of everyone's voice. And I thought, you know, we seen CSI and shit. I was like, look, I got cool with it, pro. I seen you the MP3 now, nigga. I thought they would solve the case. They never solved that case, by the way. Know that. In the midst of the cops leaving, then my people, the girl, rapper, her friends, my boy from Harlem, like three or four people, you know, a dollar late, a day late, a dollar short. They show up and they're like, what happened? And everyone's all emotional, especially the girl. And everyone's like, ah, like, why would they do that to you? You don't bother nobody. Woo, 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 woo. That's why they did it, though. The thing about spirituality, Christianity, God, universe, Allah, however you subscribe to these phenomena. These bitch ass niggas love to bother people who don't bother nobody. So, so like it's uh, most people I know who are in distress when fucked up shit happen and they say that, why did that happen to them? They don't bother nobody because that's what bitch ass niggas bother. Bitch ass niggas can only bother people who bother nobody. And I've seen this on just social media, internet, YouTube channel experience, the same thing. I don't bother them, but they're bothering me. And then when I respond, how I respond, niggas act like I'm the one with the problem. And I'm like, I don't bother nobody. So, nah, you're not bothering nobody ain't going to stop shit from happening. So you can't protect yourself from this. Like some of these stripes you got to go through. But mind you, this is all of a manifestation and a prayer and, you know, divine order of life and footsteps and you trying to make it one way, but God trying to bring you the other way. Like this is all in that testimony so yeah nothing happened to me uh, moral of the story outside of being literally afraid to death uh and being up that night like when everyone left long, long story short everyone left right i told everyone that everything i remembered i played the recording for everybody more than i would like to remember woo, 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 woo. and i'm sitting on that futon on my coast to coast am shit but ain't no coast to coast am on i'm just sitting in the dark and um i'm cursing out god again I was like, I don't bother nobody. <laughs> Yo, I'm trying to get enough money to take care of my responsibilities and get this Mac G4 popping. Why was there a gun in my face? Now, when you zoom out of it, I got the gang banging sigils on my wall. I got a hot Mac G4 in my living room. And now I'm engulfed in a social network or social energy of people who are connected to these very things. And, and I think that's the most dangerous thing about hip hop is that it takes nerdy, intelligent people to work the technology and machinery, but we're forced to work in hazardous environments. And that's funny. The only studio in, I think, Raleigh at that time was Hazardous Studios. Shout out to D.Y. Nasty and them. They're the ones that produced uh, Cameron's Confessions of Fire, real life. Anyway, so uh, I earned it. For long story short, I I didn't earn nothing happened, so I didn't earn the violence, the the fallout, and all that. You know what I'm saying? Like I was innocent enough for it not to have hurt me physically. There we go. But I wasn't innocent enough to where it wouldn't show up spiritually. Can I get an amen? So someone passed the offering. I was innocent on one level because I wasn't bothering nobody, but I wasn't innocent on the other level because I was entertaining these energies, these spirits, these sigils, and I was a beneficiary of someone else's trauma because these same niggas, I bet you, are connected to the same niggas that stole that Mac G4 because that's how life likes to do things. And whoever had that Mac G4 whatever their prayers were and whatever they were beefing with the big homie about for their G4 being missing and ending up in my living room as a hashtag manifestation. So I thought that karma just came back to me, but mind you, nothing was stolen from me. It like, what they say? No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And that's where I got this from. They say no weapon formed against you shall prosper, but they never said the weapons wouldn't form. 
So it was an incomplete manifestation of karma, but it was a over overstated. It was a obvious, obvious. I was on the wrong side of shit because of the people. I think you know what I'm saying. Decisions, the people, the shit people I bought it from, the people I was recording, the shit they were into. Like you know, what do they say? Be careful who you hang around with. Like my dad used to be big on that story. Like he watched too many hood movies. He's like, be careful what friends you drive around with, because you don't know who got a gun in the car, who got drugs on them. I'm like, nigga, if you don't. But he's right, though. In, in, in the spirit of the matter, he's right. You don't know what people got. You don't know what people got going on. You don't know who's being hunted, for real. And so the Grim Reaper, you know, he passed over my over my door, but it woke me up, you know, spiritually. Because, like, for me, this is all a prayer. This ain't, this ain't random events happening to me. I'm clocking it. I'm trying to make sense of like the connection between losing the job just to be thrown into this, just to have a gun in my face. Like I'm trying to do the nigga logic on this. Like, bro, like give me the fucking job at UPS already. Like, what are we talking about? But be it as it may, within a couple of days, the cops didn't do shit. So the streets did. They brought the kid who did that to my house. And I've told all that part of the story before. But before he did that, the guy who did that for me, before he did that, he called me and he was at the clothing store. With a gun. Pointing at the guy who opened all of that up for me. While he had the gun on him at his job in front of his Saudi Arabian manager, they called me. And he called me, he said, what do you want me to do to this nigga? And I was confused because I'm like, wait a minute, what are you talking about? This has nothing to do with him. Like some random nigga tried break into my house. There's some niggas that was in my house. I don't really trust, but you know, I can't prove they're connected yet. But out of those three connections, I know they're not really is, what's this guy doing? Like, why are we, why are we trying to, you know, turn up on this guy? I heard that whole phone call wrong. I told him, don't worry about it. Like, he ain't had nothing. Ooh, a, B, C, and D. It ain't worth it. I'm on my uh, prosperity Bible shit. So, you know, I can't afford to get deeper into that spiritual uh, catastrophe, if you will. So he backed off of him. Lord willing. I thank God he did. And then he found the kid and brought him to me. Like, this is back to back. The next day he's at his job about to beat his ass and hit him with the gun and all that dramatic shit because nothing happened to me. Right. So it's not like I got shot. It's not like I got fucked up and someone's doing it off of their emotions. Now they're doing it off of the principle that you tried me. It's like, you know what I'm saying? They're, they're, They're stressed about that. And because I said, don't worry about it, he then went further into the streets Cause I told him they're Southside niggas, Heritage Park, A, B, C, and D. And somehow or another, he found, you know, there's like, just like on Resident Evil, what are you buying? What are you selling? There's a nigga that know everybody. I never meet those niggas. I always meet those niggas. I meet those niggas. So he met that nigga, asked that nigga about that night, that situation. What has he heard? And then he triangulated it. Woo, 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 woo. Long story short, brought the nigga to my house. So that's just the other end of the manifestation. God just showing me like, it's cool. Like, and even when he brought him to my house, I didn't do nothing because it was like, I could see, I could see him as a kid. His face isn't covered. His afro is braided now. He's trying to be cute and clamorous. He's trying to talk to me about the NPC 1000 and his roommate make beats. We were just playing stupid. And he's like, this place looked familiar. And in my head, I'm like, every time he says something stupid, I want to I want to punch him. Now I have a gun. I have a gun right behind me. I didn't have a gun before that happened. I let him go. I let him go the same time the Crips were pulling up. Remember, because Saturday, it was like a week later, they're coming as he's leaving, and he was shook because he thought that he was ratted on or he thought that he got set up. 
because there's me inside the house, huge. There's him, the the fencer, I guess, you know, the guy that knows everybody, the guy that tried to rob me. And we're sitting in this little ass living room, small space, four of us. And all three and those two already turned to men to me. Know that. And then I made the decision. Nah, I'm not in no fucking this ain't oh, this ain't Scarface. This ain't the uh, what is that movie? Uh, this ain't Godfather. Like, I'm not that deep. And when you cross that threshold, you can't uncross it. And I just known that from my dad from growing up, like, you know, you, you know, and like I said, he didn't put his hands on me. He didn't take nothing. So I didn't have that. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like that. If that went a little bit differently and then they got him, that would have been different. But water under the bridge, let him go. Whoop, whoop, whoop. As, as God would have it. I, I, years later, maybe two, three years later, tops. I'm at this uh, downtown at the bus station and I picked up the slammer. We had like the slammer thing where it shows like people's arrests and stuff kind of shames him. And he was in it. And it looked like whatever crime he finally got caught for, they got him for like five to 10 years on some dumb shit. The guy, the big guy that came over the night that this happened, he also got caught up for some type of knife charge or something. He's gone 10 plus years. Um, I'm pretty sure if I knew the other kid's name that made me uncomfortable, the one out of all of them that made me feel uncomfortable, I didn't know his name, so I couldn't verify him but them two got up out of the paint they, they, they you know they got all, all of them got arrested um but i had this conversation about this story in recent time and the guy that came to to my support to my aid if you will um he said to me maybe right before i moved to charlotte he said to me you know that was john's boy right I was like, what are you talking about? He's talking about the guy from the clothing store. He said, you know, that that was his boy, right? I was like, nah, I've been producing for him and going to shows with him and went to the club to meet the guy with him. I never seen this kid that knocked on my door, came into my house ever in my life. And if that's his boy, I would know his boy's name and I would know their boys. You know what I'm saying? Like it is a small world. It's from small as fuck, obviously, because they brought the nigga back to my house. So it's a very small world. And those two people in my world didn't know each other. So I thought he said that then and I missed it because I thought he was mistaken. We had this conversation again, maybe a year after that, like a different version of it, because I think it was on my spirit. It was unsettled. Like what? Because in my head, I thought. The nigga at the club was just lining me up, making all the fucking dumbass phone calls, whoop, whoop, whoop. And the third party nigga was connected to him or divine timing. Like someone else was setting me up and the shady niggas were with me at the same time. I like I had like two or three different versions of this story in my head that made sense to me. And after, you know, I seen him and they brought him to my house, I had closure on it because now I know who it is. Like, you know what I'm saying? The fear is gone. It's not the boogeyman. It's no one I know. It's no one I disrespect. It's all simple. And then I had other situations in Leeds where it could have been because another dude, a white dude, actually, white, a white black dude <laughs> that I used to know, I used to work with at that spot before it was closed. He found out about it. And then he took me to lunch one day. No diddy. We went to Subway or something. And he almost started crying. And I was like, yo, what's wrong with you? He's, I'm just sorry how everything played out with us in the situation at the restaurant and our living situation. And he said, but I feel like this something, this had something to do with me. Like he felt like some shit he was involved in. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like somehow he felt connected to the shit too, right? So I'm like, I didn't even see that shit coming, but thank you, I guess, you know. I don't know what the fuck that is. And the or well, just because he was dating a, 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 a his 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 girlfriend, his he had a black girlfriend, of course, and she was. I think all her friends and family are bloods or something. So I think you know, nigga logic was kicking in with the white guy. <laughs> so he thought it had something to do with her and them and that. And I was like, nah, bro. I saw him. Everything, you know, everything's gonna be all right. But this man telling me within the last couple of years now, mind you, like I think that's why it's fresh. Like this shit's still pinging in my head. Like, nah, it wasn't the white boy Josh. And his and his baby mama's cousin's boyfriend and that crazy shit. It wasn't the big tall nigga. Maybe I don't know how involved he was in it, but it wasn't directly him because he can't be on two sides of the door at the same time. Um, it wasn't nobody I was recording. I had one more. I had one more special guest. I thought it was though. 
I told y'all this story before because because you gotta be careful with life. Like when I was telling you about the in my 3 a.m. the other day about punching someone in the face, like it comes back to you if you're us, like if you're in that type of path. But the the kid I beat up, I tell you this story all the time. I beat up this kid in high school really fucking badly. And it's because he tried to hurt me. And he never recovered from that. Like, the, not the really physical part. Although, he, you know, I remodeled his face, but he healed. But he never recovered from the bruise on his ego because it made him transfer schools. So he had to transfer from my school because everyone saw it. Everyone made fun of him. And even the teachers, the, the, like the football coaches, rag, ragged on him. So he transferred schools and became a rapper. Years and years go by. That same month, I met a guy who was like super passionate, you know, wanted to do something for the community. He had his own record label imprint. He's in the Library of Congress, like, you know, those types, the managers. And he's bringing me this rapper. He's like, yo, he got the bars. He's the illest rapper ever. Whoop, whoop, whoop. And he bring him over and I make a song or two with him. I record like two or three songs with him. Start talking about beats and business and, you know, acting like I know what's going on. And the last day I recorded with them, I looked at the guy I was recording, you know, like at the corner of your eye. Like I've seen him before. I've shook his hand. I, we did good work. It was good songs. He liked it. I burnt the CD. Like we've done this two or three times. But the last time I recorded him, I looked at him at the corner of my eye as I'm recording and I felt something. And then when I felt something, it made me look at him again. And then when he started talking, I was like, oh, shit, this is the nigga I beat up in high school. He was different because he got taller. He lost all his weight. He got real skinny and he started wearing glasses. So he changed his image. But I looked at his face and I was like, that's his face without glasses. But, you know, the face I remember in my head having a fight with is just with glasses now. And it was like, oh, my God. And I said something to him. My spirit just made me say something to him. And it's like, you know, it's up from there. Like, you don't know what's going to happen. You're in my house now and I'm about to tell you it's me. As if he didn't know it was me already, right? Like as if the same spirit or thought wasn't crossing his mind too. Or, or if he did not know the whole time, right? He, he was probably happy I forgot. So I said it to him. I was like, did you go to you know my high school back in 2000, 2001? And he acted shocked. He was like, oh shit. He was like, yeah, man. He said, I'm just glad we made it to the other side of that. And this is a rapping ass nigga too. Like this is a nigga that's really good with words. He said some shit like, uh, I'm, he said something, something, something papyrus, something, something Osiris. I've been ra- writing all my raps in Kuna form. Like he one of them niggas. So I, I bought it like, uh, bygones be bygones. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's just weird as fuck and intense as a man now. Like, you know, I was in ninth grade then I'm like 22, 23 now. So it was like, you know, the stakes are different. And um, so in the back of my mind, I thought it was like maybe connected to him. Like he acted like he was past it, but he's the one that made it happen type of thing. You get what I'm saying? Like revenge. No. Nah. No, nah, the whole time it was the dude I met. When I prayed and I asked God, how am I about to make it? And I gave this guy a chance. I didn't charge him for nothing. I scheduled time just for him. Because I knew shit was blown up, because I knew the energy was gonna get, you know, make people feel away over, you know, this is normal now. You 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 can see it happening. And to find out that the kid that was knocking on my door with a gun is boys with the kid that I gave my BCD to. That we ain't signed up for that when we opened up Fruity Loops. We didn't sign up for that when we opened up Quarter Pro in the top right corner it says Peter Kitzgard. Like we didn't we didn't sign up to be, you know, in these trenches. So, yeah, <clears throat> so a lot of people have always asked me, like, why I don't like Raleigh. I don't think I need a reason bigger than that. <laughs> you know, it's not Raleigh, it's me, you know, and it's my way of trying to 
let bygones be bygones, but I know that I can't trust nobody there in that context. And that kind of put me on a different path. I said all that because that's how I learned how to be an engineer because that's how I recorded the most songs and made the most custom beats. I worked the hardest with the less. I didn't have all my equipment. My computer barely worked. My internet was clear. Like I was borrowing Wi-Fi from the tech bro next door who knows how to seal off his Wi-Fi, but he didn't for me. So I didn't even have my own internet service for real. But I had internet every day, just long enough and fast enough to catch Coast to Coast AM, Anunnaki this, like the whole Billy Carson roadmap of intellect. Like that was during that time period with very, very many, many limitations to it. So uh, 3 a.m. in in the studio MG or the engineer MG was kind of born all in the same moment of life. Composure Slim says, the people you hook up the most be the main ones that want to hurt you for whatever weird reason. Exactly. It don't add up for real. R&B Garvey said, Peter Kitzgaard is the legend. You're right. Face ICU says, you gave him free studio time and free beats now. Don't, don't, don't forget. Don't, don't forget. To look at all these beats, boy. Like, come on, man. Hold on. Hold on. Do I got it? I don't even think I try to keep those songs for real. But low key, everything. I should delete them. Because fuck these niggas in the spirit of it, but it is what it is. I say all that to say, it still could have not been him. <laughs> That's what this guy said. I don't know. You know what would be crazy? Like, what if it's still somebody else? You know what I'm talking about? Like, you just never know. With it. Life is so whimsical. You don't know. That's what this person deduced. The person that brought me the person that did it now. So they would know more than anybody else because they brought the right person to me. But I don't know if they made the right. I pray in my my heart of hearts that when he kept saying that, like, you know, that's his boy. I just pray he was wrong because he's new too. he was new to the area. So maybe he missed. Maybe he's mistaken. Maybe, you know, he don't he don't know him more than I know him. So how would he know their boys? You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm going through the whole thing in my head. But I think he probably deduced that because he was talking to that kid before he brought him to my house. Like they had, they set the kid up. They got to know him and all that and got him on the music wave and he rap and all that. His roommate makes beats and they just bringing him to the studio. And the studio was my house. The one that he just tried to rob a week or two prior. But even in that, I don't, you know, I don't know if he was friends with the guy, but that's what the, that's the updated version of that story. And, um, yeah. Yeah. This is what it sounds like. Oh my. Hold on. I don't have it. Like I'm giving them these beats for free. I heels coast back and baby fat. Take a shower, then I'll lay you on your back. She says she loved the way I rip the north Cadillac. I can see you in the side, my passenger the Cadillac. So, uh, dip down the pole, hit the flow, get your money, then I'm taking you home. Oh, and come and ride with a G. I'm trying to get you out the club. Come and slide with me. So that, hey, and come and ride with a G. I'm trying to get you out the club. Come and slide with me. Hey, now make that ass drop. Got you going off the box and red bull shots. Oh. Dip down the pole, hit the flow, get your money, then I'm taking you home. I'm so oh. sick with this, need a prescription for this. Ankle bracelet with the ice on your wrist. You lose all your. Now, that may not seem crazy to you these days, but I did that as a kid, right? Like 2007. But I'm going to give you some contrast so you understand how crazy that really was. Uh, that track, to him for free, in a world where. Hold on now. This is what beats were sounding like simultaneously. Because remember, I have someone's beat CD right here versus the these are the beats that Riley would get if it wasn't Knife Wonder and his friends. Know that. You understand what I'm saying? Like, they, they, don't know rock, they weren't on Rock Battle and uh, Beat Stars yet. Like, it's me for real. So yeah, it was just it was just bewildering. R and B Garvey says if they're boys, John sets you up. Yeah, that's the thing though. I don't know if they're my gnosis of them being boys is unverified. Like I don't know. But the guy that brought me him still believes that to this day and he acted on it. He it wasn't like he just it wasn't hearsay. He wasn't saying it like you know it was such and such. No. Nah, 
he said it was such and such and he went and got him. Like, so that, that's what amplified it for me. But I didn't hear him the day that that happened. I heard him 10 years later repeat it. And I'm like, whoa, no wonder why that nigga never followed me on Facebook and MySpace and stuff no more. He just disappeared. Like he had a problem. Like, bro, I was the one that was almost fucking accosted. Why do you have the problem? And and, not, and when you start asking those dumbass questions, it start to make sense. So, yeah, man, just be careful out here. Just, just be careful out here. King of Wells says, friends want to fuck your wife and live your life. God damn. I know it was that Tupac or somebody. But yeah, I say all that to say this, this energy, this new, this new chapter, this new page energy is kind of reminiscent of those days. And, and looking back on it in retrospect, I'm glad I made it to the other side. Like the brother said, <laughs> I made it to the other side of that. And I made it to the other side of some other shit that has happened since then in the same vein. And each time I get a little bit more wiser and a little bit more colder to it, but we still here. Thank God for music. Thank God for music. And um, I feel like, you know, uh, uh to, to wrap it up nicely with the Kendrick of uh, J. Cole and the pole shift, right? Like J. Cole being amped up by Drake to go at Kendrick to go at Kendrick, for it to be well-received, by the way, and then for him to have a change of heart is on par for the course for this energy. Because think about it. J. Cole is just a dude sitting in his living room, minding his business, enjoying his success, and it's somebody else who brought him all this noise, whether it's the fans, whether that's his homies, whether it's Aubrey. And after, you know, so J. Cole had to make the decision, like, are you going to, pistol whip this kid and try to hurt him and get more information. Like, what do you, what do you, how far you want to take this seven minute drill collab with Absol, whatever, you know, that's disrespectful too, by the way, to have the collab with the TDE artists and then this TDE former artist or however you, you know, they family, but you know what I'm saying? Like that just look crazy for real. That's a flex, like in a beef battle rap, that's the full deck of cards. Right. And then for him to sleep on it, and then the rise on some MG the future shit. Like, you know what? This ain't even that. I get it. In this energy, then but now, I get it. I, I perfectly understand that. So I don't fault Jermaine for, for taking a high road. It just looks crazy because he released the disc. Like even like Beanie Siegel said, even if you mute it, the curse is still there. So it, it's corny in that respect. Like it's corny in terms of battle. Like if you look at the battle in history and you think about this moment, you're like, that was a corny battle. Cause as soon as bro, as soon as they're ready to go back and forth, niggas is apologizing. Like when you describe it on paper in history, it's gonna be corny. But on some real nigga shit though, he shouldn't have, he he should he shouldn't have came at him if he wasn't gonna keep that same energy, even for the sport of hip hop. But 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 what's beautiful in the corniness of us getting older and hip hop growing up and narcissism phasing out is that we got to see a man apologize to another man that in other scenarios or world outcomes without the hip hop should just be friends. So we don't have to create no manifested realities or hostilities that would take any of these men out of the game or away from their fans. Right? Because we saw what happened with Biggie and Pac and neither one of those situations were them. You see what I'm saying? Just like in my situation, neither one of those situations was really me, but because I subscribed to the energy, it visited me. And if K dot get J rock <laughs> and if J Cole get who he know, it's just inviting that energy to the dancery at a time like this would spill over even when the battles between lyricists and nerds. Because I'm the lyricist and nerd and I watched it spill over with niggas who weren't. So, yeah, you know, that, that this whole thing reminded me of that because I, I went through a similar parallel, although, you know, much smaller, much smaller, more dangerous, perhaps. But it, it it's the same vibes. It's like, what am I here doing this for? I rap. I make money off of rap. I got my own fucking festival that I'm in the midst of, you know, running. I'm, I'm in my festival. Like 
the whole city here, people traveling to see me. The vibes are good. Music's in a weird place, but, you know, at least I have this as a platform to push it soon in the future. Like, why am I going to, you know, tee off on Kendrick? Like, that don't make sense. But Kendrick, but, 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 but to be fair, Kendrick said what he said on record too, right? And that's why it's weird. There's the people who was hyping up Kendrick for his guest verse on that Metro Future joint. Because mind you, it's not just Kendrick in this battle. Future and Metro got to get some smoke too. Boy, if I was goddamn boy, if I was Noah Forty or or whoever J. Cole's main, J. Cole is his main producer, but man, don't, don't let me start backpedaling. Cause as a like J Cole as a rapper and a producer, I would have tore, I would have tore goddamn Metro Boom and shit up, bro. I would have stole all his drums. I would, I would have just fucked up a beat so crazy. I would have did the Memphis style beat he think he can do, and then I would have barred his ass up for like eight or sixteen bars, and then I would have got at Future real quick with Auto Tune, and then I would have came from K Dot and whoever else thought they could have it. That's just me though. But this, this ain't that. So because this ain't that. In the world got a chance to see two quote unquote men of color, <laughs> you know, piece it out as far as we understand, because this all shit could boil over and turn if Kendrick do respond or if Aubrey jump off a bridge tomorrow. But as it stands, the apology is there. We'll see if it's received or not, but it's not corny to apologize as a man. That's what I'm really trying to say. It's not corny to take the high road. It's not corny to live another day and it's not corny to to recognize that something's not genuine or something's not you you like that ain't my vibe that ain't my energy i don't need to play that game that's not corny that in 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 real real life one of j cole's most popular song is about rapping about his first wet dream that ain't the nigga i really want to see honestly crash out on nobody no disrespect i'm just saying i'm talking about linearity he don't need to be crashing out we know he can rap all them brothers can rap. Let's not let's not play games. And, and the sport or the competition or the spirit of hip hop, it it needs and needed you know Olympians, but maybe right now I don't because we're in the reset. So pole shift. But maybe maybe what hip hop needs to do is to make sure it lives longer. Hip hop needs to get out of survival mode. And and maybe that's the mark of that. So I, I'm optimistic about it. Anyway, it's your boy, MG the future. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you guys and your attention as always. Drop a like, drop a like, make sure you subscribed until next time.